All right. Well, let's, we have a resumption of the electronic open council meeting. I want to, re first of all, I want to recognize that uh, Councillor Hall is having his birthday today. And he, and he assures me that he there's no other place he'd rather be than tying into council meeting tonight. So uh, happy birthday to Councillor Hall. I want to remind everybody we have a full agenda tonight. And I will be calling on everybody just once or that wants to speak. I will not be going back to someone a second time on a topic. Uh, the If we don't get through the agenda tonight, we will be having a, a second meeting on Wednesday to finish whatever's in the agenda that we don't get to tonight. So with that, I'll go over to Madam Clerk and uh, what a supplementary agenda. Okay, so we have uh, no supplementary agenda, but I will bring to the attention item 14H. 14H was on rural fiber backbone agreement. It was initially listed on the agreement or on the agenda, sorry, um, but it is not ready yet. So it has been removed from the agenda and will come forward at a different council meeting. So that is 14H. Um, also, just with regards to pecuniary interest, I have Councillor Salmon on item 8A, the planning application for Larsh and Lucio. I have Councillor Wright, who is on 11 a, which is with regards to Ridge Holdings LP, a site plan for control. I have Councillor Latimer with regards to 14D, the use of contracted professional services. And just a quick question, Councillor Salman, do you have a conflict on 13E? I know that you declared that in closed, so. Thirteen. Hello, am I on? Thirteen now? E. Yes, you're there. Thirteen uh, E is on the sale of five forty Park Ave East Unit Five. Yeah. And okay. also, there's conflict on fourteen I in in camera. I thought they'd carry through. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Are there any other conflict of interest or pecuniary interest? Sorry. <clears throat> Thank you. That's all I have. Uh, yes, Mr. Judy. Mayor. Oh, sorry. sorry. Judy, um, ten A, Councilor Bondi, obvious reasons. I think okay. I know I'm allowed to chime in on the penalty stage, but for the yes, other just stuff, to no, clarify, so. you are allowed to speak to it, uh, but you are not allowed to vote on it. Yes, thank okay. you. Thank you for bringing that up. Anyone else? Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we'll move into item eight planning. Thank you, Mayor Kanev. The planning meeting process will be as follows. One, the clerk will announce each individual planning item. Two, the clerk will advise if any written submissions have been received for regarding a planning item. If so, the clerk will read the written submissions that have been received. Three, for any items where a written submission is received, administration will proceed with a presentation. Four, council will be asked if it has any questions of administration or the applicant, if present. Five, Council will be asked what action it wishes to take with regard to the item. Notice, if any person or public body that files an appeal of a decision of Council in respect of proposed applications does not make a submission to the Municipal Clerk of the Municipality of Chatham-Kent before the proposal is approved, they are not entitled to appeal a decision to the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal if otherwise eligible. Less in the opinion of the Tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to add the person or public body as party to the appeal. Information on Council's actions tonight will be posted on the Municipal website. All persons who have made a request or who, or who have made a submission regarding a particular planning item will receive a Notice of Council's decision, including appeal procedures. Any other person who wishes to receive a Notice of Decision must submit a written request to the Municipal Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, item 8A, application for consent and zoning bylaw amendment. Dennis and Peggy Larsh and Amy and Graham Lucio, 5295 Tecumseh Line, Community of Tilbury East, West Kent. Council, we have received um, seven sub, uh, submissions from the public with regards to this, and therefore we will uh, read them at this time. The first submission is from Dean Bradley. Our family community has existed out at Bradley Farms for 108 years. If you actually Google it, you will see the name Bradley on the map. We are concerned with what will happen with our family community if the Larsh application is denied or deferred. Basically, we think the arbitrary imposition of making it mandatory that emergency vehicles have 
have to have road access during a 250 year high flood water event is ridiculous. I think the municipality should apply some context where some sense and practicality can be used. Some of the context that applies to this issue is our farm residential area is surrounded by the ARDA dike, which also protects most of all Dover Township. The Lower Thames does not consider this protection against flooding and insists that all roads to new residential dwellings need to be so high that, the room, that they remain dry even against the worst flood event in 250 years. This is like saying that the, the Indian McGregor Creek diversion channel should not be considered flood protection, thereby denying any new housing development in the south end of Chatham. Four generations of our family lived on the banks of the Thames. While never welcome occurrences, we have both we and the municipality have had plenty of experience in dealing with flooding. Any specific flood event has, histor has historically been managed without going to the extreme of forbidding any new home construction forever, which is what the Lower Thames arbitrary rule would cause. As a family, we are going through evolution and change, just like everyone else. We are trying to transition into a home ownership structure where each individual family member can own their own dwelling. As part of this, and in order to remain cover, remain cover the cost of our family community. We need to create and upgrade sufficient housing stock to cover the costs of our shared private services, hydro, water, and roads. If the Lower Thames regulation remains in place, we will be un unable to sustain our family community and over time, it will fall apart and disappear like so many ghost communities around Chatham-Kent. I believe this is not only a tragedy for my family, but a loss to the community we live in. It is important to remember that a denial or a deferral has a larger negative impact and the implication on more than just the Larsh family. Our family and many others will also be affected in a very negative way by this decision. It is for these reasons and within this context of these points that I ask that the Larsh, the Lara application be supported. Thank you, Dean Bradley. The next deputation is from Carolyn Larsh uh, with respect to The next application or comment rather is from Carolyn Larsh and it reads they are from 5295 Tecumseh Line in Tilbury. Their comment is we support this proposal. Good use of the property. Daniel and Carolyn Larsh, Tilbury. Thanks. All right, sorry, I had microphone difficulties, sorry. Uh, to Council of Chatham-Kent, we are the owners of 5263 Tecumseh Line, Tilbury. Would like to make written representation of our opposition to the rezoning of 5295 Tecumseh Line. We would like to start out by voicing our concern about how this could potentially affect our property. Last summer, the municipality contacted us in regards to the work that needed to be done on the dike. The work that has been done has widened the dike and the property along the river at 5295 Tecumseh Line has been raised quite a bit. The consequence of our property has seen a huge increase in the amount of water that sits on the land and the property at 5295 Tecumseh Line has seen a huge decrease. At the peak of spring, the water came all the way up to the back of our shop. In addition, the water wrapped around the west side of our property and across the front. We fear that the construction of the land at 5295 Tecumseh Line will further push the water onto our land, causing water levels to continue to rise and cause damage to our property. We have already been in contact with the municipality in regards to getting this situation corrected, but have not yet heard back in regards to what the plan will be. In the past, new underground infrastructure along the road has damaged drainage systems. Again, we fear that increasing the amount of infrastructure will cause further damage to the draining systems and as a result will cause further damage to our property. We have also been in contact with our insurance company and due to the location, we are unable to get insurance for seepage or for flood. We knew this upon purchasing the property. However, we have known there was a plan for developing the land as outlined in the proposal. We would have reconsidered the purchase of our property. Our second argument for opposition stems from previous attempts to sever the land. 
it has come to our attention that approximately five years ago, the owners of the land attempted to sever and rezone the land and the application was denied. We failed to see how the application could have been denied back then and approved now. Thirdly, we would like to oppose the part of rural living. We purchased this property so that our children could grow up in a country setting. Most houses in this area are, separa are separated by agricultural land. In addition, the lot sizes are generally very large, not just in depth, but also in width. As per, our pro as per the proposal, the lot will be divided into six separate lots, each being approximately 100 feet in width and no agricultural land in between the lots. This will completely take away from the rural fear of the feel of the area and will open avenues for other developments in the future. We, as well as many neighbors, live in the country so that we can enjoy the space, peace and quiet of rural living. Having this land severed into six lots will significantly increase the amount of people living in the area. Currently, from the church down on Dauphin Road, Dauphin Road, sorry, there are are a total of nine houses taking into consideration both sides of Tecumseh Line. This property, if this property were to be severed into six lots, there would be a total of 14 houses. That is a significant increase in such a small area considering how spread out everything is currently. The addition of five properties in such a small area is going to drastically change the way our community functions in regards to activities and daily living. We would also like to oppose in regard to increased traffic. To put five additional lots in such a small area is going to greatly increase the amount of tra traffic entering and exiting the main road. Multiple new entrances will create a braking hazard when entering and exiting the bend. When traveling west on Tecumseh Line, approaching the dri driveway of 5295 Tecumseh Line, you can see the entrance to the driveway. However, you cannot see past it until you are already going through the bend. This is already what should have been considered a blind corner during high crop season at nighttime and during the winter months. Adding additional driveways that one cannot see property until it is potentially too late is going to create an unnecessary risk to both the homeowner and travelers. On the next page you will find a petition signed by many neighbors that have similar concerns as ourselves. I thank you for the time and consideration of our opposition to the severance proposal. Jordan and Cassandra are now 5263 Tecumseh Line Tilbury and the properties that are listed on the petition are five and they are 5241 Tecumseh Line, 5226 Tecumseh Line, 5173 Tecumseh Line, 5165 Tecumseh Line and 5263 Tecumseh Line. Uh, the next deputation is from Amy Lucio. My name is Amy Lucio. I am the daughter of Dennis and Peggy Larsh. I would like to speak to the current recommendation to defer the rezoning severance application, as well as the written letter of appeal submitted by Cassandra and Jordan Arnell. To start, this should be noted that upon my parents' application for severance in 2016, the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority did not object to these parcels being severed. Therefore, they went ahead with their plan and have incurred great cost in obtaining surveying and archeological dig, professional planning costs and application fees well before the Lower Thames Valley decided to retract their initial position. It was only after the Gilmore case in Dufferin County that they felt compelled to take the position they have currently, a municipality that is approximately 300 kilometers away from Chatham Kent. Now to speak to the recent appeal letter that was submitted just this past Friday on August 9th from Jordan and Cassandra Arnell. It should be noted that they have just recently purchased this property from an owner in the Larsh family and have lived at 5263 Tecumseh Line for over 20 years. As a result, they are unaware of the history of the land and have submitted a letter presenting misleading falsehoods. One, the work that was accomplished on the dike was initiated by the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority for regular maintenance after receiving information from my dad, Dennis Larsh, that there were muskrat holes in the dike, causing leaks just east of the property. Two, this land has been in the Larsh family for years. The land currently has drainage issues, which is, the Ar which is what the Arnells are referring to. They have, to sim they have simply not lived there long enough to understand these aspects. Three, my parents would be willing to consider reducing the number of lots. Four, there was no application submitted five years ago. 
and it has not been approved. The deferral of this application for the last four years has significantly, significantly impacted my parents' estate planning as they have incurred a variety of fees and time spent for this purpose. My dad specifically takes great pride in, in this land as it was passed down from generations on his side. He has maintained this land for many years. Thank you for your time. Please consider the inconsistency of the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority's reasoning and how denying this application will set a precedence to the individual rights and freedoms of landowners in Chatham-Kent from this point forward. Amy Lucio. The next deputation is by George and Julia uh, Denise and family. Summary action requested of Council. We respectfully request that Chatham-Kent Council vote down the motion of deferral concerning the large family application as recommended by municipal staff and approve a motion for the development of the large family application. Planning staff in the municipality have recommended deferral on an application by the large family who have applied to develop lots on their small riverside property in the former Tilbury East Township. It is our understanding that this project would have been approved if not for a reversal of direction by the LTVCA. The LTVCA had previously informed the Larsh family that they had no objections to the proposed development. The LTVCA then used a court ruling affecting a property in Dufferin County as the main rationale for now opposing this project. This decision and the proposed deferral by the municipality raised several questions and points that should be addressed by council. These are as follows. Is this the first development along the Thames River? No. In the package presented to Council, if I were from outside of the area and reading this for the first time, I would almost assume that this was the first development activity along the Thames River, when in reality, this is one of the last properties to be developed. There are already over 300 homes built along both sides of the Thames River from Chatham to the mouth of the Thames at Lighthouse Cove. Why is the municipality and LTVCA not being consistent in planning decisions. The deferral recommendation comes at a time when there is active construction occurring on similar properties, either adjacent or nearby to the Larch and Denise properties cited in the story report. Same road, same river, same dike system. For these properties, plans were approved and permits given within the last three years. Why defer on the Larch application when active construction is underway essentially next door? This does not make sense. In the case of a similar proposed development on ours, the Denise property, located between the Dillon and Drake side road, the LTVCA has already indicated without discussion with our family that our property is unsuitable for development. Immediately next door, 12 feet away from our property line at the same road and dike elevations, there is a house currently under construction and immediately adjacent to the two homes built in the last three years. A mile up the road on the north side of the river at which at what was a lower base property elevation there is a house currently under construction where the lot was built up as per the requirement of construction immediately across the river from our property with lots that have less than 25 percent of the depth from the road and to the river there have been three homes built in the last two years this inconsistency does not make sense why is accessibility cited as a key issue in the recommendation and in the approach taken by the LTVCA, accessibility for emergency vehicles is cited as a key reason for not approving the large proposal. In all recent approvals, the lot owners were responsible for building up the property to a minimum opening elevation, but there was no requirement for entrances or driveways as far as accessibility is concerned. So as concerns the large proposal, is the issue the driveway from the road or the road itself that is used by all surrounding dwellings as well? There is a reality that in the event of a one in 250 year flood, the accessibility issue will not be with homes recently constructed or to be built, but with the homes built in decades past. Is this not a concern to the LTBCA? In the large development and others like it were allowed to proceed, we feel it would be a simple solution for the LTBCA to stipulate solutions to address the ingress, egress, Perceived problem by way of a condition that stipulates the driveway elevations must be at least as high as the road elevation. Has that possibility been raised? And if not, why not with the Larsh family? Why lean so heavily on the Dufferin County Gilmore decision? 
the LTVCA leans heavily on a court decision regarding accessibility to a property in Dufferin County. Nowhere does it explain if the accessibility issue in Dufferin County, a county topographically distinct from Chatham-Kent, relates directly to any development in Chatham-Kent. Did LTVCA staff travel to Dufferin to the property cited to see if it related to Chatham-Kent before using this as a precedent? It also appears that there has been no formal dictate from the provincial government to conservation authorities to use this decision as the benchmark for local decisions. Chatham-Kent needs to come up with local Chatham-Kent solutions that address Chatham-Kent problems. This is why there are provisions in the Conservation Authority Act for local discretion, given each jurisdiction has its own unique circumstances. If deferred, will this also kill development in lake areas of the municipality or not? If council votes for a deferral, it is quite clear that this would likely kill the Larsh application. This despite the approvals previously given and rescinded by the LTVCA and the considerable money spent by this family before the LTVCA opinion was reversed. So as it relates to the discussion of consistency, if this project is deferred, would this not mean also that projects, including the one to be proposed by our family, would also be put in limbo? Would it not also mean that there will be no further approvals related to property in all floodplain areas in the municipality, including within the city of Chatham or in Tilbury and Thamesville? If not, why not? Why are these properties being denied? If yes, and that it would put a stop to all development, what are the implications in general for economic development in the municipality if in fact planning has been ceded for all intent and purposes to the LTVCA? As it concerns this specific recommendation for deferral, justice delayed is justice denied. And as stated in the story report, the approach taken by the LTVCA and the CK planning department is not founded on sound planning, given the local content and past interpretation of land use policies. The Larsh family has been bounced around for too long, while development has been approved and is occurring at this time around them. Council should make a decision that speaks to consistency and due process. This would require council to defeat the motion for deferral and pass a motion to approve this development. This would then allow the family to work directly with the LTVCA to resolve outstanding conditions for development and allow due process to occur in this undertaking. Through a deferral, the LTVCA is in fact using Chatham-Kent Council as the barrier to develop this and like properties. Thanks for your consideration, George and Julia, Denise and family. The next deputation is from Paul Revest. Please pass this along to the upcoming meeting on regards to the lot severance of the large property. My concern over the severance of the lots for the large family is strictly a water displacement issue, or should I say a drainage issue? We have had a progressive increase in the amount of standing water in our area. Water in the ditch by the road, water in the field to the east of my property, and in the ditch by the road on the north side of the west of my property. When the new lots are raised to build all of that water that is always laying in the large property, we'll obviously have to run off somewhere. I know some of the water will go to the drain, to the southeast drain from the large property, but a significant amount of water will come to the west, making our property flooded even, even more. And the last deputation on this item is from Doug Buchanan. Dear councillors, I am sure you would agree with the statement that experience is the best teacher, and I assure you that you have had that. I have lived and farmed for 64 years on the Buchanan property. I am now 88 years old. I've watched each spring the, ice, the breakup of ice and subsequent events for 64 years. Some of those events prior to the year 2000 were major. Ice thickness recently has been much less than the 20 to 24 inches we experienced from 1960 to 2000, which has reduced the likelihood of flooding dramatically. The worst we encountered was in the mid-1960s when the dike on the Jeanette's Creek side of our 325-acre property broke. My home was not affected and never will be. We are located on the top of the dike. There have been other events, but what I want to make clear is that in every event, we had several days warning of the impending danger and had time to prepare for evacuation if necessary. We stayed in our house patrolling dikes daily and night watching for holes which could be repaired. Good Rose backhoes were always on standby. The story doesn't end there. 
We had a hog operation and had to do an evacuation of several hogs. They went to barns that at the time, they went to barns at that time and returned after the danger passed. What I am trying to emphasize is that we did all this on existing roads in a flood prone area without endangering anyone. We always had enough time and it was done correctly. I remain Doug Buchanan. Mr. Mayor, just before we go to the presentation from planning, I just wanted to note that Tom Story is um, participating in the meeting as on behalf of the applicant and Mark Peacock is also online and he is representing LTVCA. Ryan, did you want to continue with your presentation? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor Caniff. The subject property here is located on the north side of Tecumseh Line between Dauphin Road and Pump Road in the community of Tilbury East. The property is approximately 10 and a half acres in area and contains an existing residential dwelling toward the easterly side of the property. The property is currently zoned agricultural for the majority of the property with some hazard land zoning along the dike area along the Thames River. The applications received by Chatham Kent are to create five new residential lots ranging from one and a quarter to about one and a half acres in area. The retained parcel containing the dwelling would be approximately three acres in area. Accompanying the consent application is a zoning bylaw amendment application required to rezone the lands from agricultural to recreational and lakeside residential to permit the de development of single detached dwellings on new lots. This sketch, though quite technical, demonstrates uh, the boundaries of the property, as well as five new lots created toward the westerly half of the property. These lots are each 100 feet in width and are in a slight diagonal trajectory from Tecumseh Line, extending between Tecumseh Line and the Thames River. The timing of the applications for consideration before council at this meeting and the recommended action in the planning report are essentially based on two things. The first is the applicant has a desire to advance the applications finally after years, years after starting the planning process. And secondly, the recommendation is based essentially on competing land use policy objectives, which one, promotes opportunities for residential development in attractive rural areas. And secondly, an objective to protect people and property in new development areas from flooding. There's been much discussion, and it's also indicated in many of the letters received by Council tonight, that the development context should be taken into consideration when evaluating this proposal. In short, the development context I would put into two essential categories for the development would be the existing residential land use designation of the property and many other properties along the Thames River in this area. There's also a history of development along the Thames River as evident by the many houses that exist between Chatham and the lake. And there's also a history as noted by many and remembered by many of people experiencing flooding over the past several decades. An important part of the development context in this area though is not just the existence of housing in this area and continued development on lots. It's also that climate change is expected to contribute to more frequent flooding and flood threats over time affecting this area. As well, flood protection systems and drainage infrastructure is aging and requires ongoing investment and repair. Much of the planning report is rooted in policy context. So aside from the development context, the policy context uh, is, is based in the provincial policy statement, which states that development shall generally be directed to areas outside of areas that would be rendered inaccessible to people and vehicles dur during times of flooding hazards, unless it's been demonstrated that the site has safe access appropriate for the nature of the development and the hazard. The Chatham County Official Plan bakes this policy and, and brings it into the local policy regime. Um, going further to state that development in flood hazard areas can be permitted if vehicles and people can safely enter and exit the area 
during times of flooding. So of course, it should be pointed out that some form of these policies have existed in, in planning documents for many, many years, uh, over the years where existing development has occurred uh, in this general vicinity. All of these past planning decisions were based on information considered at the time by the decision maker. Today, there's increased emphasis on flood and erosion threats in land use planning, certainly in Chatham-Kent. This increased emphasis is also included in comments received from agencies who review planning applications who have a stake in development in this area, such as the Conservation Authority. Future decisions for development in these areas should consider past experiences as suggested, but future decisions should also consider current trends as well as anticipated future needs of Chatham Kent. So what happens next, even if, regardless of the outcome of the application before Council today, it is clear that updated land development policies in areas that are susceptible to flooding and erosion hazards, including this lower reach of the Thames River, will be considered through the Climate Change Action Plan. Further work with the conservation authorities and other stakeholders will occur, and public consultation and involvement would happen along the way. Ultimately, these new policies would be incorporated into the Chatham County Official Plan. At some point in the future, these new policies would be used to evaluate land use planning decisions across Chatham Kent, where similar hazards affect different types of development in different ways. This is an involved process that will take time, and the new policies should more clearly lay out where and when how development should be allowed to occur. And, and the, these policies will not just affect these lower areas of the Thames River, it would affect uh, the Thames River watershed and its tributaries, the Sydenham River and its tributaries, Lake St. Clair, the Lake Erie shoreline, Rondo Bay and their tributaries as well. Understanding this is a brief summary and there's a very detailed planning report in several uh, well-written letters received by council at this time i would simply like to present the recommendation in the planning report and move on to questions of myself or the conservation authority next and to the applicant if there's comments it is recommended uh, is that question? oh i'm sorry mr mayor I was should i read the recommendation or yes please do oh it is recommended that a decision to approve or refuse zoning bylaw amendment application file D14 TE 2618L and consent application file B4318 to rezone and create five new residential parcels at 5295 Tecumseh Line in part of lot two concession three community of Tilbury East be deferred until such time that the applications can be reevaluated under new land use policies respecting all of Chatham Kent that will be developed and incorporated into the official plan regarding policy 3.1.2 of the provincial policy statement, which states that development shall generally be directed to areas outside of areas that would be rendered inaccessible to people and vehicles during times of flooding hazards, erosion hazards, and or dynamic beach hazards, unless it has been demonstrated that the site has safe access appropriate for the nature of the development and the natural hazards. Thank you. Does council have any questions of administration? Uh, Councillor Harrigan followed by Councillor OJ. Hi, thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Just procedurally, are you looking for questions or am I able to uh, make a motion? You can make a motion uh, at this point as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to move that the application be approved and that a bylaw to amend the zoning bylaw and draft conditions of consent to allow the proposed lot creation. Uh, Councillor Oche, would you second that? I certainly would. Okay, well, back to you, Councillor Harrigan. Thank you, uh, Mayor Kenneth. Um, I just want to start by saying that I really appreciated um, the planning staff all throughout this application. I feel like there were a number of questions that were asked um, by many counselors over email, and um, I, I really do appreciate the prompt reply to those questions and helping us understand some of these planning challenges. Um, the question that I do have is directed to uh, either planning or potentially the Lower Thames Conservation Area Authority. 
Um, and that would be, should, should this approval take place, what would next steps look like? In other words, what would a, a new homeowner or a new purchaser who would be looking to build a home, what permits would they require from Lower Thames and how are housing flooding mitigations kind of considered in those permits? Thank you, Mayor Holt. Uh, this is Ryan Jox. I would ask that uh, Mr. Mark Peacock, General Manager of the Conservation Authority, uh, address that question. Thanks, um, Mark. This, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, the Conservation Authority would require a permit for the construction of the lots. Um, that would have to go before the hearing board of the uh, authority, because at this point, um, the applications uh, don't meet the policies of the Conservation Authority. So that would be, uh, at once the planning process is complete, the, the next thing to uh, get the actual buildings built would be to go in front of the Conservation Authority Board for approval. Okay. Um, and just in follow up to that, so there are a number of current housing developments that are taking place. Um, one house on Tecumseh Line is quite near completion and construction. Uh, another house, there is uh, evidence of soon to be groundbreaking. They're, they're bringing some dirt. It seems to increase the, um, the kind of height of the ground, so to speak. Are those types of flood mitigation strategies some of the things that the board might recommend prior to issuing a permit or a condition of permit that would be required? Yes, that is, um, through your worship mayor, that is correct. Those are the types of conditions that would be um, requested. One of the things to be uh, uh, to be clear about is many of those uh, buildings being constructed now are on historic lots of record and have historic approvals. This is unique in that these lots being considered are new lots being created. So um, there could be actual approvals in place for those uh, those uh, applications that have different conditions that then we may consider for these ones. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments um, and, and most of the comments actually that I have were shared by Ryan in his presentation. So Ryan, thank you for that. Your presentation commented on the need to update land development policies and to make sure that those land development policies would be considered with significant public consultation, with community involvement, um, and very clearly lay out the where and when development might happen. Um, that policy development is not case-based or precedent-based. And I think it's very unfair for us as a council to approve literally the lot down the road seven years ago, the lot a little bit closer five or six years ago, for this application to be received four years ago and for us to suddenly say, okay, now is the line in the sand, even though you're in process, we're going to deny you. I don't think that's good policy making. Um, and I recognize um, certainly the potential flooding that needs to be considered, but as was heard in the deputation, many of the locals who live on the Thames River, myself and my family members included, are very aware of the risks that we take to enjoy the benefits of living on the water. And that's something in Chatham-Kent that's not unique to Ward 1. All across our wards, we have water properties, and we have to balance as council the policy making for what we do to support the benefits and the beauties of rural living or living on the water in comparison to how we mitigate with the climate change that we know is happening all around us. And I think that's a larger policy conversation, and it is in incredibly unfair to the Larsh family to not process this because of our lack of discussion. I think if anything, this application should send a note to our staff and ourselves as council that these conversations need to be had, but I do not think a planning application is the time in which to have them. I also wanted to comment about the size of the lots because I do recognize um, the one um, deputation that was received by the Arnell family in terms of the size of the lots, and I think that while it is really important to consider that if you do move into a place and you're surrounded by a farm, it might be an adjustment to suddenly have neighbors around you. But the size of the lots being one and a quarter to one and a half acres within the area 
are consistent with a number of other lot sizes on Tecumseh line within a kilometer distance from one area or another. Um, and I also think it's important to note that the community that's being created, um, that, that is very much my community, is one that has been created by historical families who own significant amounts of farmland, who've made the decision to sever lots and share their family's historical farmland as part of their secession or retirement planning with other community members. So 20 years ago, my parents were able to build a house on Tecumseh Line because of the severance enables. And certainly it comes with, you know, muskrats on the dike and those sorts of things that need to be dealt with. Um, but it also is, is part of creating community. And that's, I think, what is really important for us to continue to make sure we do in our policy making today and as we move forward. So those are all my comments, Mayor Kenneth. I hope other members of council will support this application going forward. And we will entrust the Lower Thames Conservation Authority in outlining what sort of mitigating flood risk factors um, could be applied to any building permits that would be made going forward. Councillor Oche, followed by Councillor Pinsonal. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you to Ryan. Ryan, uh, have we not been uh, reinforcing the dike all summer um, in, the, in this particular area? Well, just about from Merlin Town Line to Jeanette's Creek. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Um, I don't know the exact locations, but certainly over the last two years, particularly since the 2019 floods in the area, the drainage division and our infrastructure and engineering services department uh, have been undertaking uh, quite a lot of, of dike repair, uh, coring the dike, which is digging out, you know, sandy, silty soil and replacing with clay, raising the dikes in several locations. There's more work to be done here uh, as well with uh, some of the uh, municipal drains in the area as well. Uh, work at this particular property has not occurred. It's occurred on the dike uh, just just west, and, and there's some ongoing uh, drainage processes that one of the letters alluded to. But it's certainly a, a costly and ongoing endeavor uh, to repair and upgrade the, the infrastructure in this area. Yeah, so at some point, I would think within the next year to year and a half, we We'll be doing that area as well with uh, with the clay, and I know some of the uh, some of the dike hasn't just been raised; it's been widened as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, would you agree with that? That it'll be taken like that part of the area will also be uh, dug out of the sand, the sand dug out, and clay put into that area. I expect so, but for the particulars, I would have to refer to um, the drainage division or infrastructure engineering services for the timing and nature of the work that would be ongoing in that area. Okay, okay. Um, secondly, uh, the ditch, uh, I know when we build a, uh, a residence and like a whole neighborhood in, in town or not that six, not that five houses or a resident uh, neighborhood, but uh, they have to take care of the all the drainage, do they not? Yes, that's correct. So um, through site grading, uh, uh, water is not permitted under sort of civil law to drain onto abutting properties. Uh, the challenge with this property and many others in this area is that the drainage infrastructure does not extend. Uh, through the frontage of this property. The large drain ends at the easterly extent, other drains uh, are further west. Uh, so what happens here is much of the water drains to the roadside ditch. The area is fairly flat, so water sits and pools. So uh, this is an issue best addressed through the drainage act process. And, and like I said, our drainage superintendents and uh, appointed engineers uh, they are on the case, and, and uh, it is also the nature of the Drainage Act process that these things take time and will come to a drainage board hearing as, as these projects move forward and as the private property owners are involved as well, because certainly under the Drainage Act, private property owners are a, a driving force uh, through that process as well as they incur costs uh, throughout the way. Okay, so the, the drainage should be taken care of, the dike should be taken care of, and 
another question I have uh, through your worship would be wording. Could we not put some wording in there that when they sell these ditches that to let the people know that are, or not these ditches, I apologize. Um, these lots that uh, um, they are in a flood area, a low lying area that could flood. Something like that, uh, if it's not revealed by you know, a listing agent or, or the owner at that time, um, the, the floodplain area is identified in the Chatham County official plan. Um, however, uh, as the recommendation reads, there would not be any any provision for the owner to, to do this. And it's it's not standard. I'd have to maybe get some advice or turn my mind to what, what that condition would look like as it relates to the to a severance okay. i i would if if um melissa would be fine with that i would like to add that um that we have some type of wording that says that uh you know that that it is enough uh, a potential flood area not to it, it hasn't flooded for many years so uh that particular area but uh i know what we went through a couple of years ago um with one field <clears throat> excuse me so i'm not sure if melissa would let me put that in as a friendly amendment or not but yeah okay, so Harrigan, okay, you Harrigan. yeah i'm certainly good with that? open to that being in item three uh i just need clarity uh, potentially from ryan as to how that is communicated and when like i recognize we're approving the planning perhaps it's item number three that direction be given to the applicants that they are encouraged to acknowledge the floodplain in which they're severing the lot or they're selling the lots thank you mira Caniff. um a couple of uh thoughts come to mind and i'll try to try to be very quick here typically uh, in areas where there is some sort of hazard or inconvenience such as uh, flooding or, or for instance noise when you're near a railway Typically, there uh, you'd often see a notice registered on title of the lands that would inform all future um, people investigating title that there was some something extra to consider. Um, the challenge of adding it as a, a separate recommendation is is I don't frankly council can't through a motion direct a private property owner to do something in the future so it would have to be something that could be done before the severances took place and tied to the conditions of consent um, my recommendation would be to add a condition of consent item vi that a notice of the natural flooding hazard be registered on title of the subject property and that this notice be to the satisfaction of the manager of legal services. Councillor Oche and Councillor Harrigan, are you good with that? I am good with that, but it's Councillor Harrigan's motion. I'm also I'm also good with that. I would um, I would be very interested to hear what um, Mr. Story how Mr. Story feels about that if he's also open to that on behalf of his clients. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll get to him uh, shortly. Once we're done uh, questions from council, then we'll, we'll, Mr. Story will have his uh, time to speak. Excuse me. Okay, Councillor Pinsano followed by Councillor Sakachi. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I am going to support this severance. I, we definitely need a lot of assessment growth in this community, and I think this one does make sense. Here where I live in Thamesville, we've seen some new homes built here just recently. And uh, we know we're in a floodplain, and the lower Thames, uh, they'll determine the elevation of the uh, foundations. And I could see that happening here as well if, if we pass this tonight. The lower Thames is going to uh, dictate to them where, where the basement's got to be. And, and I think if you do that, and they're going to they're gonna do it to a, a, you know, a high water so that they're safe level, and um, I, I just think we need to move forward this process and, you know, start it here. 
Um, I like the idea of the being put on title that it is a floodplain. Um, Thamesville, the whole town of Thamesville is uh, considered a floodplain, and anybody buying here knows that, and anybody building a house here knows that. So I can see this working. I think, uh, you know, all the checks and balances got to be put into place, but uh, I am going to support it. I think it's it's a, a good spot to build homes, and um, I'd like to see it move forward. Thank you. Councillor Sakachi, followed by Councillor Finn. Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. I just wanted to touch base uh, quickly with either uh, Mr. J Jocks or or Mark. I'm just curious to see, from a policy standpoint uh, regarding process, when people are in the middle of uh, you know something like this, um, is it standardized to basically uh, disapprove the the application, uh, even though the process is, is underway? And I'm just kind of see is there a lot of that in the community where we have you know because there's been a lot of some changes in you know the shoreline you know erosions and the, you know kind of our, our planning moving forward do we have a lot of properties that are that are in the middle of a process process that are not going to be kind of denied based on you know the timing thank you mayor Caniff. It, it's not a common occurrence uh, the circumstances with this application um, as noted in the report are you know, after the planning process started, the Gilmore decision in Dufferin County influenced the Conservation Authority in its thinking, which in turn influenced the municipality. Over that time, um, Chatham can experienced a number of uh, priority emergencies that took many key staff, the Conservation Authority and within the municipality away from focusing on policy work. Uh, this was certainly some policy work that we wanted to endeavor to do starting a couple years ago, but with subsequent flooding on the Thames River in 18 and 19, high lake levels and, um, you know, Lake Erie affecting our south shoreline substantially, you know, a lot of the, the resources and a lot of the public's focus was, was diverted. So, um, you know, not an excuse, certainly, to to have this application go on for this long, uh, but that, that's some of the things that were going on at the time. But no, there's there's no other planning applications in process now, but certainly our experiences on the Lake Erie shoreline and the good work that came out of that Lake Erie shoreline study is deterring people from developing and it certainly changed the municipality's approach as far as administration and consulting with people wanting to develop and create lots on the shoreline. And from a policy formulation perspective, um, you know, to put this whole planning process uh, on a timeline, uh, that background study, um, you know, took a couple of years, and now we have it. There's a lot of good information, but Chatham Kent hasn't even yet uh, taken a step forward on on that policy work. So, uh, at least at Lake Erie, we have a background study and a, and a playbook to go by, a starting point. Uh, for some of these other areas along the Thames and Sydenham rivers, we've not even done the background work yet. So, like I said, this is going to take time and, and it, it could affect different people along the way in different ways. And last follow-up question then. So, so if this this happens to be deferred or the record, the the, um, the motion that Councillor Harrigan has, has put forth to recommend it, um, what happens with all the existing uh, uh, funds and, and time and, and money and effort that the these residents have put in, uh, you know, and, and with the policy, sorry, not the policy, but the decision being changed kind of partway through, is that money then just now now lost? Is there any kind of thing in, in the structure to to refund or reimburse any funds based on the fact that this has changed uh, partway through the decision? Yeah, if the application's approved tonight, uh, hopefully that those investments will carry this project forward and uh, new lots can be created and the process can continue. Uh, should the application be deferred, then obviously the, the process is not continuing immediately and those investments, uh, the benefit of those investments uh, would remain to be seen for some time. If the application's refused, unfortunately, uh, many of those costs uh, were likely incurred through private transactions uh, with private companies providing services and as far as the planning application fee um, it would require a motion of council 
uh, to refund as it's a matter under the fee bylaw and council's policy with accepting fees for planning applications. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And then the last thing is I've heard the deferred uh, mentioned quite some time. When we're speaking of deferred, does that mean deferred with a timeline? Does that mean deferred indefinitely? Um, it is deferring this really basically just another way of saying this is just going to be, um, you know, kind of wrote off uh, just because I, I don't really see any, you know, if, if it were to be deferred, it just seems to me like that we're talking about deferring this permanently. Uh, would that be your assessment as well? Uh, my assessment that is that the recommendation implies it would be deferred indefinitely. It's very difficult to put a timeline on uh, policy formulation and public process, especially when it relates to, to something so fundamental across Chatham-Kent uh, as far as natural hazard planning. Um, sorry, there's a second part of uh, the question there and I've lost it, apologize. I actually, I think that your, your response is sufficient. Uh, and as always, you know, you're, the way you respond and the details and how you articulate is very much appreciated. Uh, and I do greatly appreciate the detail that you've uh, commented on, on all the questions. So thank you for that, Brian. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Finn, followed by Councillor Foss. Mine have been taken care of with Councillor Sakachi and part of Mr. Peacock's answers. Okay, uh, Councillor Foss. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I guess uh, my question is, if we approve this tonight, are we setting a precedence? Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. No, I don't think so. Uh, we're in a period of time where uh, Council's decision to approve uh, would be uh, consistent with its past decision making. Uh, so if past decision making is indicative of a policy position, it's not a deviation. And it does not fetter Council's ability to make new policies in the future uh, through the proper processes in order to evaluate future applications. The challenge will be if there's similar applications that come forward, you know, in the next couple of years uh, that have uh, similar characteristics. Certainly, you know, we may be having this discussion again at some point, uh, but with this experience, I hope we approach it, uh, with, you know, with this under our belt and uh, we can do that more expeditiously uh, and more uh, fair for all parties. Okay, uh, second question then. Um, does this automatically give approval to the north side of the uh, Thames River, to the Bradleys and the other uh, places? No, this decision would affect only this property under this application. Okay, and I guess I'm getting the impression probably from the emails we're getting that if this gets turned down, the other ones will be turned down because they're in similar situations. Is that correct? That's what I read into the uh, submissions by those residents. However, I, I do want to stress to Council that each development proposal is different. Uh, each uh, development location has its own a history and set of circumstances and these would need to be considered on their own merits uh, before a recommendation was brought forward to council okay now i know the drainage department was consulted on this and it doesn't show in the report that they're uh, supporting this uh, development very much uh, is there plans uh, and maybe it's a question for uh, tim dix group uh, regarding uh, uh, the repairs that are needed on the art of dyke would they be sufficient enough to uh, to be a long lasting repair? Thank you, Councillor Foss. I'm, I'm not the appropriate person to answer that question. I'm not sure if Tim is available or uh, perhaps if, if uh, I could put Thomas uh, on the spot to speak to some of that, those infrastructure projects and, and opportunities we have. Mr. Kelly, are you available? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so our uh, drainage team is actively looking uh, really under the DMAF funding that we're going through. And uh, we have various projects set up in the area. 
along uh, the Thames River as well. And uh, any work we do there uh, certainly is is going to be lasting. The, the last work lasted almost 50 years. So that's our intent. It would be a long-term investment. Um, and it's something that uh, we're analyzing and working through as the problems occur and as we discover them. Uh, certainly the high water level has added to the whole stress of the support. And uh, it's very much a work in process at all times. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. All right, uh, seeing all the questions, I'll uh, ask Mr. Story to make some comments regarding the application. Mr. Story, are you there? Tom, if you're there, we can't hear you. Okay, uh, given that uh, he's not responding, uh, if there's no other questions or uh, thoughts, what we do, we'll put it to vote, uh, put the motion to vote. Just keeping in mind that Councillor Salmon has a conflict. We're waiting for one more. All votes are in. Motion passes. Moving on to 8B, application for zoning bylaw amendment, Robert and Paul McCulley and the municipality of Chatham-Kent, 218. 808 Mall Road and 10833 and 10851 Pinehurst Line, Community of Harwich, South Kent. Just to let Council know, we have not received any deputations on this. However, planning has sent uh, Council an email this afternoon. There was uh, one small item that needed uh, revision on the bylaw. So there is a revised bylaw with this. And um, that's all I have. Uh, just to note also that the applicant is on the line. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Scotch and Councillor Thompson, can I get you to put this on the floor, please? So moved, Mayor Caniff. So seconded. Uh, any questions related to this? Hearing none, we'll put it to vote. Waiting for one more. All votes are in. Motion passes. 8C, application for draft plan and subdivision, Jodamar Properties Limited, Dale Drive, Community of Chatham City. We have received no deputations and the applicant is not online. Councillor Crew and Councillor Salmon, can I get you to put this on the floor, please? Also move. Uh, if I can, can I get Councillor Finn then to put it to second it, please? Happy to second. Okay. Any questions? Hearing none, we'll put it to vote. Missing two right now. All votes are in. Motion carries. 
8D, Application for Consent and Zoning Bylaw Amendment. Rosalie Dubuque, 24161 Winterline Road, Community of Dover, North Kent. We have received no deputations and the applicant is not online. Councillor Foss and Councillor McGrail, can I get you put this floor, please? Uh, so move. Seconded. Any questions? Hearing none, we'll put it to vote. All votes are in. Motion passes. Final planning application 8E, application for consent and zoning bylaw amendment. Stephen and Kyle Crackle, 9163 Drury Line, Community of Harwich, South Kent. We have received no deputations and the applicant is on the line, Mr. Jim Wickett. Councillor Latimer and Councillor Scotchy, can I get you to put this on the floor, please? So moved. Seconded, Mayor Kenneth. Any questions? Hearing none, we'll put it to vote. All votes are in. Motion passes. Okay, that ends the planning part of our meeting. Uh, we'll move into the regular meeting. Uh, item nine, deputations. Thank you, Council. Uh, this evening we have six deputations. Uh, it's between two reports, 14J, which is the 2021 budget opportunities for 0%, and 15C shelter applications for Chatham-Kent. I'll hand it over to Kathy to start. So the first deputation is related to 14J 2021 budget opportunities. This is uh, from Mike Grail, CK Economic Recovery Task Force co-chair. On behalf of the entire CK ERTF committee, both Rocky Goodrow and I would like to thank council and administration for ongoing efforts and for continuing to explore all opportunities in response to the recommendations made from the May 25th, 2020 report. It is recommended that council approve further analysis of the proposed items related to service delivery to efficiently provide quality core services to Chatham Kent residents and to achieve a 2021 budget target of zero percent. And number two, detailed reports be brought to Council on or prior to the November 9, 2020 Council meeting for Council's final approval ahead of the 2021 budget deliberations. I refer back to the CKERTF report on May 25, 2020, specifically, quote, recommendation number three, grow Chatham Kent's economy, midterm and long term, end quote. Reduction of services and infrastructure assets, reduction based on least used assets and services. and assets that both yield an ROI as well as meet the targets for 2035 growth strategy, end quote. We encourage an independent business review identifying opportunities to make informed, fact-based decisions on the rationalization of assets, legacy buildings, consolidation of services, and changing the way we offer services is complicated and would require a detailed report outlining a strategy and recommendations on how to proceed. This report would take emotion out of the decision making. Use of this report would lead to effective decisions while being minimally disruptive to services, ensuring that the community is focused on growth, however, not negatively affected by changes to legacy services. In conclusion, Mr. Quinton's report falls in line with our group's objectives and we fully endorse his report in its entirety. These recommendations show administration's desire to be more strategic and we endorse this as it will support lower taxes for 2021. As an aside, this group would like to offer thanks and acknowledge the great work being done for helping small business owners through the grant program. Your leadership shows that you are actively part of the solution and highlights the partnership in CK to not only survive, but thrive into the future. Michael Grail, CK ERTF co-chair. 
Next deputation is on item 15 C and that is the uh, shelter. And uh, sorry, the shelter options for Chatham Kent. We, the undersigned, are writing to express our objection to establishing a homeless shelter at the Chatham Conference Hall and Banquet Center on Merritt Ave. This area is densely populated with a combination of apartments, condominiums, and single family homes. We are sympathetic to the plight of the homeless in Chatham Kent and acknowledge the growing need for a shelter. There is an undeniable correlation between homeless and drug abuse and with mental health issues. The proposed location is unacceptable for many reasons and puts re residents at risk. It is alarming that no written notification about this proposal was given. An alternative in a less residential area must be found. The Chatham Conference Hall and Banquet Centre is located across the street from the Winston Churchill Public School. From the playground, the students will be exposed to lewd behaviour and profane language on a daily basis. The majority of the students walk to school and will undoubtedly be subject to erratic and potentially dangerous behaviour as they cross paths with shelter clients. In addition, the school's grounds are regularly enjoyed by residents in the evenings, on weekends and during school breaks. Families enjoying the playground equipment, playing sports or walking their dogs in this large open green space. Unfortunately, there have been cases of illegal drug use happening at night in the playground. Children have found needles and wrist infection. The school recently trimmed the bottom of the evergreen trees along the perimeter to improve sight lines to deter illegal activity and gathering after dark. Locating a shelter across the street will exuberate these problems and will discourage physical activity outdoors as families will become fearful of what they will see and hear when they leave the safety of their homes. In recent years, a tent city has emerged in the field at the end of Earl Drive and very close proximity to the proposed shelter location. The tent city will certainly swell in size as more homeless people will congregate by the shelter and will need a place to stay during the day. There will be a steady stream of shelter clients wa walking from the shelter to the downtown core along King Street throughout each day. Illicit drug use will inevitably lead to an increase in break-ins and violence in the neighborhood. This is particularly frightening for a large and vulnerable population in our neighborhood, senior citizens, many who live alone. The proximity of illegal activities will compound the difficulties of many of the citizens who live in the low income Orchard Heights area of the neighborhood who are actively working to rise further above the poverty line. The combination of homeless shelters and a growing tent city will lead to the ghettoization of a once vital neighborhood. Property values will decrease and community spirit will erode as citizens spend more time in an effort to distance themselves from dangerous, frightening and unsavory behavior. We regret that we cannot voice our concerns in person at the August 10th council meeting due to the pandemic. As residents of Ward 6, we implore you to protect our gem of a neighborhood. Just as the former St. Joseph School and the Wish Center were rejected as shelter locations due to the negative impact on residents and businesses in the area, the Chatham Conference Center and Banquet Hall must be rejected as a shelter location. And it has been um, submitted by Holly Sparling and there are over 50 um, signatures on this petition, all from that neighborhood. The next deputation is on item 14J, the 2021 budget opportunities for 0% and is by Bill Laux. I am writing in support of the recommendation to council, recommendations to council that are being presented tonight by Gord Quinton. As an owner of a manufacturing companies in Ridgetown and Chatham, farmland in the municipality, as well as commercial property in our community, I have a truly broad perspective on what is best for Chatham Kent as a whole. Although I currently live in Chatham, I was a resident of Ridgetown at the time of amalgamation, so I am aware of the concerns of people who do not live in Chatham. One concern that unites all of the residents of Chatham-Kent is the cost of property taxes and the sustainability of continuing to refuse to make changes to the way things have always been done. No local business would be able to survive without making changes to the way they operate. The current pandemic has made it hard for many businesses to survive. One local business, which I have significant investment, saw revenues go to zero as a result of the pandemic. 
This business will survive with the financial support of the owners and the ability of the employees to develop new products, which would not otherwise have been developed. Unfortunately, in the short term, hard choices, including layoffs and wage, re wage reductions have been made in order to, for the business to survive. My associates and I are willing to help fund a, fund a study of ways to make the municipality become more efficient, providing council is willing to proceed with the recommendations for improvement. After spending most of my career in, the public account, in public accounting, I am aware of many business leaders in our community who have the interest in the community, who, who have the interests of the community at heart. I am willing to personally reach out to business leaders in the agricultural and other non-manufacturing sectors of our local economy to help fund and support a study. This should help assure members of council that any recommendations have the broad support of the Chatham Kent community. In closing, I am willing to give both my time and money to help make Chatham Kent a better place. Please support the recommendations by administration so that we can all work for the betterment of our community. Respectfully submitted, Bill Lux. The next deputation is with respect to item 15C, shelter options in Chatham. Kent. My name is Steve Pratt and I currently serve as the CEO of United Way of Chatham Kent. Now more than ever it is important we come together as a community to support our most vulnerable friends and neighbours. These are challenging and uncertain times but the research is clear and consistent. Community matters especially in times of crisis. The stronger the sense of connection, local people working together, the more resilient the community. And we are resilient. We are a community that cares about each other. We at United Way see it every year, call it an uprising of care. People like you showing your local love, also the place where we live and work is great for all of us. COVID-19 is putting our community's most vulnerable people in an extremely challenging situation. Those who already face significant barriers, including poverty, homelessness and socialization, need even more of our help during this time. And we need our social infrastructure, that invisible network of agencies people visit, call and rely on every day in your neighborhood to be in place now and in the future. As the largest investor in social services next to government, we're working closely with more than 60 of our community's frontline agencies to identify the gaps, needs, trends and opportunities that have been emerging locally. We're helping them navigate change and offering them flexible funding so they can do what they do best, meet urgent needs for people. These frontline community agencies are working in new ways to ensure that those who are most vulnerable in our communities have access to the critical supports they need close to home. A need that emerged at the beginning of the pandemic was the ability to support our rapidly growing, visibly homeless population. Folks unable to access supports they once did, left with nowhere to turn in their time of need. It was evident that a solution was needed and fast. Community partners supporting our homeless are in agreement that a shelter is not a viable long-term solution, but is absolutely essential in the short term during the pandemic. We are in full support of exploring options with Indwell and look forward to also hearing the report back to council before the end of the year. On a personal note, as some of you are aware of my history, I have dealt with mental health and addiction issues myself and have experienced homelessness firsthand. I was able to connect with supports here in Chatham Kent and have rebuilt my life and career to a point where I am now able to give back and help support our community's most vulnerable. No one wakes up one day and decides to become addicted to drugs or to be homeless. It is a series of events many of which folks have had little control over and often traumatic in nature that leads someone to this point in life, but it is a point in life, not a destination. My life is just one example of what is possible when community wraps around a person in a time of crisis. Change is possible, growth is possible. We will do everything we can as a united way in partnership with the municipality and our community partners to ensure folks receive the support they need to help find shelter, recover, and have access to an opportunity to build a better life for themselves. The need for the shelter is not the challenge in front of you, rather it's the location. Trust your administration's recommendations. I believe they have done their homework. We are in crisis. This shelter solution needs to move forward now. I encourage you to vote for in favor of helping those in need with an opportunity for a second chance. 
I am so incredibly grateful of the second chance I was given. What if it was you? What if it was someone you know or love? Vote as if it were Steve Pratt. Next deputation is on 2021 budget opportunities for 0% budget, and it was submitted by Gail Hunt, President and CEO of the Chatham-Kent Chamber of Commerce. In regards to the above mentioned council agenda, please note the support of the Pro Board of Directors of the Chatham-Kent Chamber of Commerce of the report and recommendations therein. Now more than ever, there is a need of, for findings, means to control costs to maintain a lean budget for the business and community. Whereas some items being addressed may well have been implemented in past, now is an ideal time to assure taxpayers of all pro proactive initiatives to curtail expenses. While the COVID pandemic has caused many challenging circumstances on business and community, we trust you will find this correspondence timely and appropriate to support your actions to find savings in services, products, and delivery. We recognize such actions will be difficult, yet also recognize such decisions will be made for a prosperous future in Chatham-Kent in mind. And lastly, we have a deputation from the Prosperity Roundtable. It's with regard to 15C, the shelter options in Chatham-Kent. Dear Mayor Caniff, I am the lived experienced consultant with the CK Prosperity Roundtable, and I'm the chair of the Voices of Poverty, an advocacy group who supports the well being and advocates for those facing barriers, roadblocks, and challenges of poverty throughout our community. Our group learned that council would be deciding the new location of the temporary shelter during the Monday, August 10th, 2020 council meeting. We thought it was important to support Director Polly Smith's recommendations, as well as share people's stories about their experience with homelessness and the shelters to support your decision. Homelessness is, homelessness is not a choice made by an individual. It happens by circumstances beyond their control. People become displaced, lost, and alone, get into substance abuse, suffer from mental illness. Most do not have the ability to seek the supports and services they need, and poverty deprives them of the help and supports they need to reach their potential. When people in general see a stray or domestic wild animal, abandoned, hungry, and hurt, their first reaction out of compassion is to help and feed them, house them where they will be safe and cared for. When many people from this community see someone who is homeless, a human being struggling and living on the street, they look the other way. People who are homeless are considered a disease. They are ignored, and judged without much compassion and humanity. I know what it's like to be homeless. I was homeless 45 years ago, not by choice. I know the challenges that are before them. I was fortunate enough to have someone that was compassionate who gave me a hand up before I fell into long-term homelessness and deep despair. The homeless in our community deserve and need the same compassion and help from this community. Our community needs to support the homeless shelter organized by Employment and Social Services. The shelter is the best way to assist people facing homelessness to obtain the services and supports they need to transition out of homelessness and find appropriate housing. The location proposed by Director Polly Smith meets the needs of the shelter residents with their current services maintained. It is located only a few blocks from the current shelter, preventing the residents from being displaced across a large area. Further, by placing it within a mixed use neighborhood near bus routes and other services, the shelter can still support community integration for residents. We ask that you listen to and support Director Polly Smith's recommendations outlined in her report to move the homeless shelter to a suitable location, 280 Merritt Avenue in Chatham. This location will ensure the supports provided at the shelter keep meeting the needs of the people facing homelessness for the next 18 to 24 months. Respectfully, Sharon Olds, Lived Experience Consultant. Okay, we'll move to the consent agenda. Put up the motion here to, uh, to show which ones we're gonna be voting for. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to let council know, I know they like me to read them out so they can mark them off on their agenda. So I will be reading the ones that we will be pulling, and, sorry, that we will be voting on as a consent agenda and that we will not be discussing further after this motion. They'll be approved in one motion. So those items are 10C, 
11 B, C, and D, 12 A, 13 B, C, and D, 14 E, F, G, And actually, I is listed on the screen, but we will have to remove that as Councillor Solman has a conflict. So we will have to pull that one and vote on that separately. And then 15B. Uh, Councillor B. McGregor. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Um, it's not part of the consent agenda, but uh, I did want to see if we could move forward an item from the communicated items. Uh, and that was the uh, mass petition. Um, I know there's significant interest in tonight, so uh, I wanted to make a motion based on that item and hope we could uh, deal with that from the outset. Okay, uh, so thank you, Mr. Uh, Councillor Brock McGregor. Um, I think we potentially have this one on the floor, the consent agenda. So if we could finish this one, and then I can speak to uh, bringing the um, petition forward uh, from the communication items because it wasn't an item that was on the agenda it requires a two-thirds vote to be able to deal with that this evening so should we receive a two-thirds vote from council to put that on the floor we can do so if not then we could list it on a future uh, meetings for further discussion but if we could finish the consent motion and then bring your motion to the floor okay perfect I I'd move the uh, consent motion uh, Councillor Solomon, you seconding that? No, I was going to just say the same thing that uh, the clerk did. Okay. Uh, can I get, uh, will you second the uh, consent approval since I've got you on the line? I'm not sure I can. I got to look at the wall here. Yeah, you're good because uh, we've we've excluded the ones that you've declared a conflict on. And the ones that I see on the screen are ones that are going to be discussed or not going to be discussed. These are not, not going to be discussed. Okay, um, I'll move that, but I have a question once I get a seconder. Okay, well, no, uh, Councillor B. McGregor already has uh, moved it, so you second well, it. I'll second it now. I have a question. All right, go ahead. I'm always confused by the new procedure that we're using. Um, before when we wanted items uh, removed from uh, the consent matter, we had to put our hand up and uh, ask for it to be removed. And apparently we're not doing that anymore. Uh, Councillor Solomon, so because of the uh, new processes and, and stuff, the emails that I had sent out to council when we send out agenda is to let yeah. me know in advance just to kind of expedite this so we can put it right up on the screen rather than going through the time to put it on. So if there happens to be one that uh, you have not mentioned yet, but you would like pulled for discussion, we can quickly do that now. No, I want to, no, that isn't it. I, before we were transparent and we knew who was putting their hand up to have things pulled. Uh, now we don't have oh. that. Oh, sorry. You. When the, when the ones are pulled, um, when we get to those on the agenda, we will, um, the mayor goes to that person first who has pulled the report. Oh, okay, fine. Thank you. That clarifies it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, we'll put it to vote. Uh, we're missing one more, sorry. Okay, all votes are in. Motion passes. Okay, Councillor B. McGregor, we'll move to your request. Apparently, well, you have a motion uh, that you'd like to put up. I need a seconder on that. Uh, we'll wait to get it up there and I'll look for a seconder. Okay, uh, uh, Councillor Harrigan. Hi, I'm happy to second Councillor McGregor's motion. 
Okay, uh, Councillor B. McGregor, would you like to make some uh, comments regarding this? Yeah, so I think that uh, this is an issue that, that should reasonably be dealt with tonight. We've seen what is a significant amount of uh, discussion amongst the public and uh, a significant amount of feedback. So I think uh, while this is unorthodox to uh, bring something forward, uh, waiving notice and voting on it tonight, I do think in this case uh, it is appropriate. And I look forward to you know whether council is supportive of a mass bylaw or not. Uh, I would encourage uh, my colleagues to uh, vote in favor of voting on it tonight. Councillor Harrigan. I have nothing, nothing further to add on the uh, two thirds vote. Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Okay, uh, I just wanna add, I, I don't see any other questions, but I would like to add something. I just, that this has uh, certainly been an unprecedented issue in our community. Uh, I've never seen so many uh, people reaching out whether it's for or against uh, masking. And uh, I think it's critical that we deal with it tonight. I wouldn't want to leave it to the end of the meeting and not deal with it and tell the public that uh, we we deferred it. So I think that it's, it's imperative we deal with it and whatever the outcome is, but we need to deal with it at this, uh, this time. Thanks. So we'll put it to vote now. As we wait for council to vote, just to clarify, a two thirds vote requires uh, 12 councillors to vote in favour to waive notice. Still waiting for two. Okay, all votes are in. And it does pass uh, by a two thirds vote. So we will be dealing with the mask bylaw this evening. Okay, uh, given that, I would like to do 10A first uh, as we have the Integrity Commissioner on uh, the line and then we will deal with uh, the motion by Councillor B. McGregor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, we have a report uh, on the agenda this evening, uh, Council, and it's been on the website. Uh, it has been submitted by our Integrity Commissioner. Uh, according to the Code of Conduct, uh, it is required to come to the floor of Council and um, all three uh, motions are required to be voted on and they're required to be voted on separately. And uh, therefore, that's why we have pulled this. And uh, also, I just wanted to make note that uh, Councillor Bondi had received the uh, report in advance and he has already uh, submitted an apology, which is also attached to the report uh, behind the Integrity Commissioner's report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Solomon. Thank you, Worship. A question, and then I'll bring a motion. Um, I see the motion that has been put up on the screen. Uh, is there a legal requirement that we uh, vote on that motion? Um, I don't see anything in any statute that says that, but um, uh, Councillor, if uh, you want me to answer that question? There is no legal requirement that you vote on that motion. Okay, uh, thank you. I'd like to bring a motion then, Your Worship, uh, that the uh, Integrity Commissioner's report be received and no further action taken. Do I have a seconder for that? Uh, Councillor Finn? Happy to second. Okay, we'll get that up on the screen. Is any... Uh, uh, well, back to you, Councillor Solman. Any comments? Uh, no, he's already uh, uh, formally apologized. It's uh, it's attached to the uh, report. Um, that and uh, the publicity that has occurred uh, is, uh, I think, sufficient. Mr. Chair, it's it's Kathy Hoffman speaking for a moment. Perhaps uh, Ms. Bench could also comment on this. Our municipal code of conduct actually indicates that council is required to vote on each one of the recommendations put forward by the integrity commissioner. So I'm not sure that, uh, I think they still have to vote on each of the recommendations. My answer is based on the statute. Uh, if 
if uh, the code of conduct uh, would require a vote on each of the recommendations, then uh, you've, uh, you're correct that uh, the code of conduct is also part of what should be reviewed and um, I miss that. But uh, the motion to receive the report is still a valid motion. It, it just makes these redundant. So just for council's reference, it is section D in our municipal uh, code of conduct that discusses the council decision and the third paragraph, sorry, rather the, um, uh, let me just find the actual right one for you there. Sorry, it's the first paragraph that actually says council shall decide and the municipal clerk shall record the vote of each member of council with respect to each recommendation made by the integrity commissioner. Am I still on here? Um, if we, if my motion passes, we've dealt with the entire, uh, all three of the matters because Councillor Bondi already formally uh, apologized. So that one is, doesn't need to be voted on. And the third is if he fails to apologize, which doesn't need to be voted on because he did apologize, that only leaves number one. And so my motion is that we receive the report and take no further action. So we voted on number one. That's very simple. Councillor Salmon, I believe that the uh, the intention of the of this section of the code is to actually oblige council to have to vote on each recommendation that an integrity commissioner provides in his or her report. Right. Well, you can't, Mr. Chair, uh, Your Worship. Uh, number two makes no sense any longer since it is it is prospective when it was written. And he already apologized. So, what are we going to vote on? In favor of him apologizing, he already did it. Number three, we can't vote on it because he already apologized. It says he failed to apologize. So, what are we going to do? Vote yes or no on on it? He's he's already apologized. So that's irrelevant. So the only one that really matters is number one, which is Councillor formerly reprimand Councillor Bondi, and I've just brought a motion that says we take no further action. So that means we're not formally reprimanding Councillor Bondi. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see how that's complicated. You can't possibly vote on the, on two and three uh, because there's no yes or no to them. Yes, yes, I. Uh, there's no yes or no to number two and three. So, uh, does someone disagree with that? So, just waiting. So if you put uh, any... number two, Your Worship. If you were to put number two to us. And we have to vote yes or no. What would we be voting yes or no to? Did he formally apologize? He's already done that within a week. Councillor Solomon. The report says. And, he, right. and you can't vote on number three because he didn't fail to apologize. There's no yes or no to that. So the number one has a yes or no. And I just brought the motion that is the no to that. That we take no further action. Councillor Solomon, I think with respect to. Uh, Number two, first of all, council determines whether or not the apology that you've received uh, is acceptable. That is what so, the motion says. Uh, right. That is what the recommendation says. It says to formally apologize within the week or two, right? And he did that. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, and then with respect to number one, uh, that is still an item that council can can vote on. Yes, and my motion addresses that that we take no action. Anyway, if council feels different than that, um, and they think that number two and three can be voted on a yes or no, I, I've said my piece. That's so all to be said. It doesn't. So perhaps one last final comment again, I'll just go back to the uh, at the writing of the code. The spirit of that was to oblige council 
note on each recommendations made by an integrity commissioner and broken out specifically for each one of those recommendations. So I think from a process perspective and in keeping in the spirit of which the code was written with this particular section, it would be most appropriate for each of the three to be voted on, notwithstanding the fact that councillor or sort of that uh, item number two, therefore item three seems moot at this point because council Bondi has issued an apology, but I think it would still be appropriate to vote on the three given the spirit of how this was written at the time. Uh, I'll leave it, Your Worship. I don't see how you can vote on moot questions. Mm -hmm. All you right. Can't uh, vote so yes or no to two, and you can't vote yes or no to three. So, you so have given that, uh, so uh, Councillor Salmon, will you be moving number one then in this case, or are you, no, you going to look for something? I've already made my motion and it was second. All right. All right, uh, Councillor C. McGregor, followed by Councillor Kirkwood White. Councillor C. McGregor, we can't hear you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. Um, and this is just through to uh, our integrity commissioner. Um, and it is my understanding uh, count that council formally reprimand council councillor Bondi. Um, we have done so, have we not, by bringing this to a public meeting? Isn't that deemed as as reprimand um, on behalf of council? Uh, no, it is not, councillor. No. Bringing this to a public meeting is something that is required as part of the code of conduct. Okay. So, okay, thank you. So these will be separated then so that that uh, uh, we can answer these separately then. Okay, thank you. That's all I needed. Councillor Kirkwood White. Councillor Kirkwood White, do you have any comments? My apologies, I didn't have my uh, on uh, mute, unmuted. Um, I just wanted to say that it was uh, rather unfortunate that we have to follow the rules as uh, as laid out, and this would have been better dealt with uh, in closed session, I believe, uh, where we could have dealt with the acceptance of. Uh, Councillor Bondi's formal apology there, but these are the rules and therefore I will move item number one and look for a seconder. Point of order, Your Worship, you already have a motion on the floor. Yes, so yes, uh, we do have a motion from Councillor Solman and a seconder, so we will be uh, voting on that. If it is this is turned down, then we will move to the voting on one, two and three. So any other questions related to that? Okay, we just uh, need uh, some time for the technical change in the motion on this end. It's on the screen. Our IT person's taken 30 seconds here. Okay, uh, we're ready to vote. Okay, all votes are in. Motion passes.
Okay, we will move on to Councillor B. McGregor's uh, motion relating to the masking. So, Councillor B. McGregor, I think we'll put the your motion up here. Thank you. Uh, the motion reads that Council approve a bylaw mandating masks in indoor public spaces and that further amendments be developed in consultation with the MOH addressing other preventative measures including physical distancing requirements and the provision of hand sanitizer in public spaces to be discussed at the September 14th meeting. Okay, uh, can I get a seconder, Councillor Harrigan? Yes, Mayor Kenneth, I will second that motion. Okay, uh, back to you, Councillor B. McGregor. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Uh, I just wanted to start by recognizing the hard work of public health throughout the, this pandemic and really the importance of those early actions in protecting our community. I think it's also important to recognize the breadth and importance of the work ahead uh, by public health. Uh, from what is a substantial amount of public feedback, I think our responsibility is to discuss and enact uh, and act on this file this evening. Uh, those that have reached out in support of mandatory masking agree with the hierarchy that Dr. Colby has maintained, that physical distancing, maintaining social circles and built space primary prevention remain the most important aspects of preventing community transmission. Passing this bylaw and mandating masks in indoor public spaces does not promote masks as an alternative to any of these practices, but rather as an adjunct or complement. While evidence is not perfect, which is, is most often the case, we have seen a shifting balance regarding recommendations from various public health agencies in Ontario and across Canada promoting uh, and mandating masking. It's important to note in our own community there are areas where we've already seen value in mandating masking, including in personal care settings and public transit. What we're really speaking about this evening is expanding that to include indoor public spaces. I think it is reasonable that if we are asked to wear a mask to our doctor's offices to get a haircut, to visit a massage therapist, we can wear a mask when grabbing some groceries or visiting a local retail shop. Over the past few days and weeks, a number of physicians within our community, as well as most recently the Medical Advisory Committee at CKHA, have expressed their support for mandatory masking. I think that we should take this feedback into strong consideration. The regional reality is along with Lambton County, we remain the only locale in Ontario without mandatory masking. We've recently heard from some of our business community about the challenges this presents and why a number of them support this mandate as well. I think of note in the bylaw that was circulated to, uh, to council in advance, uh, it's very similar to other communities, notably uh, Sarnia, uh, with as expected exemptions for small children, uh, those engaged in, in exercise, <clears throat> and those with pre-existing conditions. And as we go through this pandemic together, I think it's vitally important that we do our best to prevent shaming around both mask wearing and the inability to wear a mask and uphold respect for each other. Along with passing uh, the bylaw as drafted currently, on the advice of Dr. Colby, adding additional amendments to promote distancing, hand washing, and barriers where appropriate, I believe is a prudent next step. I'm hopeful that on the balance of evidence and the support of our medical community, we can move forward with this tonight. And it is also my hope that as a community, we can move past the, the at times negative tone around this polarizing topic and to continue to move through this pandemic supporting each other. Thank you. Councillor Harrigan. Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. I wanted to just begin my comments by um, recognizing that as a council, there's certainly been some hesitancy to address the topic of masking. And this is not new for us as councillors. We're often called to discuss uh, and make decisions outside of our areas of expertise. In fact, we do this at every meeting, and I certainly feel like a non-expert every time I have a conversation about drainage with uh, either Thomas Kelly and team or people in my ward. And in those scenarios, we rely both on the opinions and advice of our staff and also the expertise and experiences of those in our community. And I think it's very important for the public to be made aware of the support in the medical community who are the experts for the approval of this masking bylaw in Chatham Kent. So as many counselors are aware, we received a number of um, correspondence from physicians in the community who not only wrote to council, but also provided me with their express consent to share their names in support of the bylaw. And I'm going to do so now so that the public understands the breadth of support this receives in the medical community. Dr. Elizabeth Haddad, Dr. Nadine Yamin, Dr. Nicole Campbell, 
Dr. Prima Sami, Dr. Dax Biondi, Dr. Robert Wismer, Dr. Paul Rickett, Dr. D.W. Asher, Dr. Jason Denise, Dr. Sean Segrin, Dr. Brent Rowden, Dr. Zeke Milkovic, Dr. Donna Waterhead, Dr. Allison Moran, Dr. Susan Monroe, Dr. Lindsay Sutherland, Dr. Jim Wheeler, Dr. David Miller, Dr. Sandra Gregorovich, Dr. Han Punt, Dr. Heather Branton, Dr. Linda Sinave, and as Councillor McGregor had mentioned, the MAC at CKHA. These physicians and their correspondents have cited for us literature, their firsthand experience, and case studies that support the use of cloth masks. They have also urged caution and adoption of what is becoming the norm across not just Ontario, but North America and the world. The draft bylaw law that is proposed, as presented, aligns with school board regulations and policies. And as mentioned, it encourages us to continue to work in partnership with Dr. Colby, recognizing that social distancing and hand hygiene are the best defenses we have against COVID-19. The bylaw supports businesses, as we've heard, in safe operation of their public facing businesses and their staff. And ultimately, at the end of this pandemic, we need to be sure that as leaders in the community, we've done everything that we can do to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This bylaw is not one that's being made out of fear, but rather responsibility. And some might say that in Chatham-Kent, we've been very lucky. We've had low hospital rates and low numbers, and the early adoption of preventative mechanisms has really helped us. But as a community, we've also seen two deaths due to COVID-19. And for me as a leader, that's too, too many. So if this bylaw can prevent even just one COVID-19 case or death in our community, it's certainly worth adopting. So I fully support this and encourage my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. Councillor Fosk, followed by Councillor Pinsonal. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I uh, just have a couple of comments, I guess. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Colby and the health unit for the work that they've done in keeping control of uh, this COVID-19 in our community. I'm uh, a bit disappointed. Usually when there's a, uh, a crisis, whether it be a, a war or something like that, uh, communities are brought together, working together for a common cause. But the uh, uh, face mask uh, situation has divided uh, our community and, uh, and I'm very disappointed in that. I was encouraged when the, uh, when the pandemic first started where we had the miracle May 16th, which was a very successful uh, show of uh, community support and working together in trying to uh, deal with this uh, pandemic. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed. I hope that after uh, whatever the results are today, that this community can move forward, uh, deal with the pandemic, and uh, and work together in in in, uh, in dealing with this crisis. Uh, and hopefully, uh, before long, that a, 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 a vaccination can be found and to cure this. Um, I agree with uh, Councillor McGregor that we move forward. And uh, and uh, and and get back to a community that uh, works together and uh, can resolve issues without being divided, like this uh, uh, situation is done. Thank you, Councillor Pinsono, followed by Councillor Latimer. Thank you, Worship. I personally don't think we should be making policy on the fly. You know, we've done this in the past; it just never seems to work out. Um, with the cotton masks, I think there is a false sense of security. The N95 mask, yes, they are they are a good protector. Social distancing is always the best uh, route to go along with hand sanitizers and uh, hand washing the whole bit. The I think when you got a mask on, people assume that it it is safe to get up close and personal. I don't I don't you know and it, with a cotton mask. It's not safe to get up close and personal. When you social distance, you know your distance that you've got. Um, this bylaw should have went through the policy process, in my opinion. My question is, and I'm not even sure who it's through, maybe to April. If this uh, bylaw passes, who decides when 
the bylaws done or uh, it ends? Is it when we go to stage four? Um, if somebody can answer that. So through you, Mayor Caniff, it's April Retake General Manager, Community Human Services. Um, I think I think that's a, a a couple of questions in there, Councillor Pimpano. Certainly, when we look at the the province and the opening uh, as they have deemed it, there are a number of phases within that opening, and there are a number of stages in the phases. And so right now we are in stage three of phase two. Um, there is no stage four. It uh, Once we get past stage three, we will move to phase three. Uh, it's confusing for us as well, um, where that will be a recovery phase. So we anticipate that while there may be some changes uh, coming from the province with respect to some other openings um, or increasing in numbers, we're not sure, uh, in stage three. Uh, we anticipate that until we hit uh, recovery from this pandemic, that we will remain in stage three of phase two. So with respect to uh, when does a bylaw end, I think, I think that's probably better answered by Dave Taylor and what can council put in place uh, in terms of uh, the terms of a bylaw. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, David Taylor here, uh, just following up to Dr. Rudek's comments. So the current draft of the bylaw doesn't have an end date. And the reason for that is we, we just don't know what will happen in the pandemic so uh, setting any sort of firm end date um, you know wasn't uh, something that really made a lot of sense because there's lots of moving parts here but certainly council could set through a, a adjustment to this motion that either the bylaw ends at a specific time and that would force the matter to come back to council or uh, could direct administration certainly through a motion to uh, bring the issue back to council floor. Uh, but at the current drafting, there is no uh, set end date with any sort of uh, happening of a switch from one phase to the other or, or by actual uh, uh, specific date. Okay, thank you for that clarity. So the reality is we could still be dealing with this at this time next year. Um, second question, does it take a two thirds vote to uh, to uh, reverse this decision, I'm assuming it would if it if there's no end date. So I might refer that matter over to Judy Clerk as to whether that would be a uh, reconsideration uh, vote or whether a repeal of the bylaw uh, would not. I can give my thoughts, but I think that is probably appropriately for the clerk. Uh, thank you. This is Judy Clerk. <laughs> um, I think it would depend at the time of what the motion was. So if it was to simply re repeal the bylaw, I don't think that requires a two-thirds vote. But if it was to amend what is currently on the floor and, uh, um, you know, we'd have to see what it was worded. If it's just an additional clause within the bylaw, then that's just adding to the bylaw and that doesn't require a two-thirds. So I think we would have to be more clear as what that look like before we could say whether it requires a two-thirds or not okay so i'm i'm saying i'm going to bring a motion i'm hypothetically speaking i'm going to bring a motion to completely repeal the uh the uh bylaw that would take a two-thirds correct no to repeal a bylaw would not okay remove it i'm sorry i said that wrong remove the bylaw so it's not mandatory anymore I think I would have to consult with legal on that <laughs> now that so you pass it over to me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Your Worship. As David Taylor, I would agree with uh, the way uh, Judy described that, that a repeal of the entire bylaw would not require a two-thirds vote because that's not voting on the same thing. Uh, but I think a passing a different bylaw amendments, uh, there are ways that that uh, could result in a two-thirds vote. But you know, to your specific question, Councillor, no, a repeal of the bylaw in the future, I do not believe would be a two-thirds motion. Okay, thank you. 
I uh, I can't support this. I'm, thank you. Councillor Latimer followed by Councillor Thompson. Mayor, just trying to get back to my notes here. I am, uh, I, I feel it is never good policy to enact legislation based on personal bias and community fear. And I have also have remarks from physicians in our community who very clearly state Dr. David Colby is in charge of public health decision making within Chatham Kent. His expertise in this matter is far deeper than any of the rest of us family physicians here in Chatham Kent. His qualifications for his child posting are extensive, and frankly, Chatham is lucky to have a physician of his caliber. Um, I think it's very dangerous um, myself uh, for municipal councils to start to pick and choose which public health mandates they are going to mandate or not to mandate, contrary to public health advisement. There is a reason we have a public health institution. And I, I don't want to minimize in any way um, the, the concerns that have clearly been communicated to me on both sides of this question. And I have kept a very close tally of uh, uh, 4951. Um, answer uh, a response here and and uh, I just cannot support this based on the fact that I do not feel that council should be really overriding our medical officer of health and to mandate the thank you Uh, Councillor Thompson, followed by Councillor Hall. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would very much echo Councillor Latimer and Councillor Pinsono's comments. I'm now being forced to make a political decision tonight because I can't view it as a medical decision because I'm not qualified to view it as a medical decision. Um, I trust in Dr. David Colby. I trust in experts. We have an expert. I don't know. It seems like sometimes we only trust experts we agree with. But when we, we decide to make political decisions and make these sorts of policy decisions in, quite frankly, the most terrible way possible, um, I, I'm reminded of what happens south of the border when we politicize these sorts of issues. And I can appreciate the, um, the political pressure on both sides. I have a, a resident here in South Kent who hasn't left her home since March because she has a, a myriad of, of health concerns. And I, I spoke to another resident today who's in hospital due to a lung infection and the doctors there told her it's because she wore a mask all day. I'm not qualified to make the sort of decision that measures medical advice and value of lives. And I, I resent being put in this position, as, as the case may be. <sighs> and frankly, I, don't, I still don't know what I'm going to do. I've spoken to a lot of people who make very good arguments on both sides. And I know I'm not convincing or changing anybody's mind here, but I'm talking to the residents who might be listening tonight. We're going to see these comments somewhere in the future that this has been a maelstrom of emotions over the last 24 to 48 hours, probably, well, even longer into the end of the last week. This is very much for me akin to the Erie Shore Drive issue. I was not looking forward to tonight's meeting. I guess the only thing that I, I could say that is if I'm, I'm making a political choice, I can't put the individual rights first at the expense of community and family. So. I'm going to leave it there. I'm, I'm interested to hear what other people have to say, but this is not a decision the council should be making. Councillor Hall, followed by Councillor C. McGregor. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. I'm going to start with a question actually for staff and then uh, add a couple comments as well. Um, so a question to staff, if we pass this, uh, this uh, bylaw tonight, um, how will enforcement work? Like how will uh, 
who will be handling the enforcement duties? How will uh, how will this bylaw be enforced? Mayor Ken, if it's April, do you want me to tackle that? Sure. Thank you. Um, certainly when we look at enforcement of all bylaws, and certainly, uh, again, I will turn to Dave if anything that I am sharing is not accurate. Uh, we have um, bylaw enforcement officers, we have public health inspectors, and we have police officers that are all um, capable of enforcing uh, bylaws that are passed by council. Uh, and so um, that's how any type of bylaw is enforced uh, in our community. And I don't, I don't know, Dave, if you have anything to add to that or not. Uh, thank you, Dr. Redek. Uh, I agree. Uh with everything you said there in terms of uh, there's a few different options of where the groups uh, the different groups within the municipality that do by law enforcement and and how this could be enforced I think just the speed at which this has uh, happened in comparison to uh, other bylaws I don't know that there's been a discussion at the management team as to exactly which team would take it but certainly there will be options for uh, administration to consider uh, if uh, council passes this bylaw Okay, thank you uh, very much, April, and thank you, Dave. Um, and just a couple comments as well. Um, and I'll echo what, what you know what uh, what some of my colleagues have already said. We've heard and gotten an incredible amount of feedback on this issue, uh, especially over the last uh, over the weekend and, and into last week as well, uh, from residents all over Chatham Kent uh, to as as Councillor Harrigan mentioned to the medical professionals in our community, and even residents from outside of our borders as well. Uh, so I just I, I appreciate everyone that reached out and you know I know this uh, uh, the way we're going about this tonight in terms of public consultation and how the process generally works it's uh, uh, it, you know it's not not typical um, but I am confident just by the the, the magnitude of information and, and feedback we've received I feel that the the community was able to express their uh, their views on this um, so I've really personally I've made a an effort to try to keep an open mind throughout this whole process. Um, especially when it was clear that we uh, that it was going to be uh, coming up this evening. I've wrestled with it and I've had it top of mind, struggled with it. Uh, I've, I've tried to weigh all the information that I've heard and, and that I've read and that I've discovered throughout uh, what, while preparing for tonight. I, uh, I told myself with this and, and even before I was elected that I would always try to try to do what was right, especially with an issue that's like this is so uh, polarizing. I think uh, Councillor Brock McGregor said earlier and to, Tonight, I believe the right thing to do and, and a way for us to enhance the safety of our residents during this pandemic especially is to make masks mandatory across Chatham Kent. Uh, the pandemic has challenged all of us everywhere. This issue has challenged us as a council and as a community, but making tough decisions is what we were elected to do. Um, so I'll support the motion by Councillor McGregor tonight, and I believe we should uh, approve the bylaw this evening as well. I believe it's the right thing to do. So thank you, Mayor Cannon. Councillor C. McGregor, followed by Councillor Sakachi. Thank you, uh, Mayor Kenneth. Um, and I apologize if you're getting background noises. I'm sitting on my porch. So um, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, mention the fact that, uh, um, you know, this has been very tough for each and every one of us. Uh, we have had a great deal of feedback for, as a matter of fact, since about noon hour today, I think I've received about 43 emails and that's not counting what we've had for days. So I feel very confident that we have, have uh, had a lot of input from the community. It's been actually very difficult keeping up with all of the input um, as this is, has unfolded. Um, however, I think, you know, in the, in the instant that, uh, we are trying to move and pass us tonight. I feel very confident that we've got a very good um, amount of feedback from the community and where we need to go in the future. So it's not always, uh, you know, felt that, you know, that maybe we should be making this decision. 
but you know, in, in certain times there are, and we've faced other difficult decisions in the past that you know we've had to rely on council to to make some decisions, whether it be windmills, whether it be smoking bylaws, and different things that have transformed within our community over the years. And so I, you know, I feel that you know having it addressed at the council level, um, you know, on an issue this polarized again as as councillor b mcgregor said um is something we need to deal with and and i don't think by going on for days or weeks is going to help us or our community move forward during this time and and through this pandemic um i've been lucky enough as a counselor to uh, hold a position um, at a provincial table um, as my uh, one of my as my position on the board of health, I have um, been able to be elected to a position provincially to the Association of Local Public Health Agencies, and I've been doing that since my first term. And actually, this year, and, and actually my second time around, I am the I am the president of the association. We spend a great deal of time dealing with all public health issues and and all issues that cross. Uh, the public health table, whether it be immunization, whether it be pandemic, whether it be, you know, a whole swath of other of other things. But, um, you know, recently um, I signed a letter as president, along with the vice president, who is the medical officer um, from Cornwall and the the president or sorry, the chair of the Board of Health section from from northern Ontario, from Dryden. And we sent a letter lobbying. Um, Christine Elliott and Premier Ford to make this mandatory. They've chosen not to do that. Um, now, there are other and many other reasons and they have depended on the medical officers of health to, to, try, and, to try and do some of that. We are, and or we have led the way and really, you know, I, I was really led the way in the beginning of this. And I think that we, you know, we can still do this and we still need to move forward. Um, you know, I, I have struggled terribly because I really don't like to go against our, our medical officer or health direction. But, you know, what I've seen and what I've heard throughout the province and the people that I talk to, um, you know, I don't think it is necessarily hurting and yes there needs to be understanding of masks and people people are gaining and gathering that information all the time um you know as as early as today between our, our closed session and our open session meeting i was watching the news and duke university had just released a study where they had tested masks and you know people are talking about you know what mask is good and what mask is not of course the n95 is the best and, and obviously should be kept for kept for all of our health practitioners um surgical masks the paper surgical masks that you that you get and that are available online and and locally um, were also rated very high as were cotton masks they need to be a number of layers but they were also rated very high um, the ones that were not were felt masks which i'm not sure Maybe that's a winter mask, I don't know. And neck sleeves um, are not really rated really high. So I think that as a public health and as a, as a municipality, we can very well uh, try to educate and put that information out there and hopefully reach all the people that have contacted us to get that information out on the proper masking uh, going forward. So um, obviously I'm going to support this and I hope that everybody would consider doing the same so that we can again move forward and work as a community and uh, and and get through this so that we can get back to whatever our new normal becomes after the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Councillor Sakachi followed by Councillor McGrail. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Uh, I greatly appreciate the, the floor. Uh, first and foremost, I really wanted to take public health, uh, thank public health and the entire team and all the frontline staff that continue to give their all for the safety of our community. Um, it's, it's challenging to follow up with some of the comments that have already been said, and, and I don't want to become redundant. Um, but, uh, you know, I want to apologize to so many people that have reached out to me that I have, you know, I'm sure many counselors have had a really hard time and struggled to respond back to 
as many calls and emails as we ha we've had on so many different items on the agenda today that's kind of fallen you know to the back seat because of this item uh, we've ha had the ability to hear the uh, you know the community very very loudly um, Councillor Harrigan, I, I really don't think could have done a better job uh, by how she kind of went through the process of um, making this decision. Um, and I just want to say that at the end of the day, you know, regardless of the decision, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be um, upset potentially. But uh, to Councillor Foss's uh, statement, um, right now our communities need to unite across the board. Our businesses you need to unite. We need to keep supporting our local establishments. A lot of our local establishments feel that, you know, a masking, um, you know, bylaw would help them uh, if it was universal. And, uh, you know, division does us no favors. And I think that we need to, to utilize, uh, you know, us uniting the best we can to ensure that our community can still prosper through this uh, tremendously different, difficult time. So because of the output I've heard from the, the community and largely a favor of, of mass, you know, it's a very difficult decision for for me to have to make because I didn't, uh, you know, become a counselor to, to you know, think uh, on voting on a public health issue. Um, but I did want to ensure that I uh, advocated for the majority of the people that I heard. And uh, um, I guess that's all for my comments. And I really wanted to say thank you to, uh, you know, to, to Dr. Colby and uh, Mayor Canna for being so available uh, to the public through these times as well. And uh, that's all for my, my comments. Thank you. Councilor McGrail, followed by Councilor Wright. Thank you, Mayor Canna. I guess I, I, I too, as long as, as with everybody else, have really struggled here. Um, but the red flag to me right now, there's a couple of things, obviously, that I am not a medical expert. And this is where we rely on our, our medical experts to help us through this. But the next piece that I'm a little concerned about is the added uh, bylaw and the impl implications um, going forward that if we in bring in the added bylaws of social distancing and um, hand, sanita hand sanitization stations within every single business is the implications on businesses themselves. Um, there's no you know, discrepancy between the small business that maybe have one or two people come in you know, at one time to you know, big box stores. Obviously, there is a difference, and we think about wearing masks. I think about you know going to our local grocery stores where there is a lot of people, and and social distancing is you know sometimes an issue. But then we have the other small you know smaller businesses or the businesses that do not have the foot traffic, you know that at these big stores do, and now we're imposing and will impose on them um, new bylaws. So. Um, I am cautious about that, um, and so at this point, I can't support this either because I, you know, I, I'm going to go with Dr. Colby and his advice um, with the current bylaw as it stands. Thank you, Councillor Wright, followed by Councillor Solomon. Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Um, I cannot support this because I feel that at this time we are second guessing Dr. Colby's decision. And I agree with Trevor Thompson that this has become a political statement. Thank you. Councillor Solomon. Thank, thank you, Worship. Uh, the um, bylaw or the motion as it stands, I have difficulty with um, the wording of it. And I'll explain why. Um, we, we don't, I think the public should know that, be, emphasize that the social media that indicated that this was on the agenda tonight was wrong. And I think we, if they're listening, they now know that. Uh, many aren't listening, but uh, to this uh, streaming, but this simply was not on the agenda. And council, you should know, did not receive a uh, draft bylaw until the weekend, uh, nor did it receive, um, a uh, lengthy explanation from our medical officer of health until the weekend. So council on Monday is now being called upon to make decisions with very little uh, input uh, from our advisors. Lots of uh, emails, which break down to about 50-50, so that's not all that helpful. Um, 
but I think you should know the background. I think it's important that the public know the background. Uh, when bylaws are usually brought, uh, there is public input, not through emails and social media in the Twitter sphere, uh, but uh, actual proper uh, notice. That isn't happening here. Uh, nonetheless, uh, my concern is that I, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand of late our medical off, it's been framed as a uh, medical officer of health versus other uh, general practitioners and other other folks. I understand that as of late uh, today, our medical officer of health uh, certainly do, would not oppose the bylaw mandating masks, provided that it also addresses the preventative measures of physical distancing, hand washing, and provision of uh, sanitizers in public uh, spaces. And I think that if that if we're going to go forward, I don't know why we're waiting till September 14th. We should have a proper bylaw drafted, including his recommendations with respect to those issues and get it over with either this week or the start of next week. Um, half done uh, bylaw is, is not what we need to do. Um, so I really think we should, shouldn't be supporting this as it is set up now, but rather uh, having it set over to either Wednesday of this week and having our administration address a full bylaw and present it to us rather than a draft that still needs revisions. I think they should also tell us about what, what uh, experiences have occurred in other communities so we know how to deal with that. I think they should have a recommendation just as they did with the smoking bylaw, if you'll recall, well, maybe very few of us were actually here when that happened. Um, and we had the same, believe me, there were more deaths from uh, secondhand smoke and smoking. Uh, we had the same arguments that uh, one death was one too many, uh, but we also put in place an education process so that people would learn that uh, smoking was bad for them. Uh, we should also have an education report coming from administration should say that we should have an education process uh, on masking so people understand the importance of that too. I don't see any of that and I think we should have had, a, as we normally do with uh, important matters of this nature, uh, to have a report from administration setting those things forward. I think it's important that we understand the implications of uh, policing uh, the uh, any bylaw that's passed. There's, there's no point doing it unless it's a feel good thing, unless you're going to then police the bylaw and make sure that people, in fact, um, understand it and obey it. Uh, and that's why I think we should uh, have this matter put over just to Wednesday and at the latest next Monday to get those kind of things addressed and to have the medical officer of health um, issues uh, placed in the bylaw. There's, I don't see any reason to wait to September 14th. And uh, I think we should be um, going forward that way. I've, I've always said that to other counselors that we're not here to make the popular decisions. Uh, we're not, we're here to make uh, the right decisions with sufficient input from our advisors after we've had time to carefully consider them. Um, that isn't the case right now. Um, and I would like to ask a question, Your Worship, to uh, Mr. Taylor. Uh, uh, may I? Through you, Your Worship? Yes, please. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Taylor, what date were you anticipating that the bylaw that we have not, ha we don't have before us, uh, is going to be effective? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So the draft uh, that was sent to council provides an effective date of uh, this Friday. And we uh, had some quick discussions over the weekend about whether it should be you know, effective tonight as most of our bylaws are when council passes them. Uh, but the discussion was to try to give some delay time periods. So section nine of the draft that was uh, sent to council uh, provides an effective date of uh, 12.01 on August 14th, which is uh, this Friday would give businesses time to uh, get in, uh, you know, get their plans taken care of. Certainly council could uh, could change that. If I could also just maybe just speak to the other point that you just made, councillor, 
um, kind of two two pieces there. One is I'm I'm quite confident in the drafting of this current bylaw if council wants to go this direction certainly it's council's direction but just for your information we did uh kind of beg borrow and steal from other municipalities to put this together so in terms of the you know internal coherence of the drafting i'm quite confident in it uh, but maybe on the other side of that coin which is the idea of being ready with a fully drafted bylaw to now address these other items, you know, by Wednesday or a week from now. I just put a pause on that time frame if council has an indication to go in that direction, just because we don't have precedence for um, physical distancing uh, bylaws, and I haven't had a chance to really review some of the other aspects that Dr. Colby was. Uh, suggesting may be included so that will take some legal analysis to make sure it's clearly within municipal powers and make sure that any sort of exemptions or, or other drafting requirements necessary for a bylaw can be addressed before it's in front of council uh, with those kind of other items for consideration so again we're in council's hand of course the you know you you tell us what to do and what uh, what our priorities are but I just wanted to flag that concern that too tight of a time frame um, might put us in a spot where we aren't uh, having enough uh, time to draft those other changes as well well uh, your worship uh, I, I think Wednesday is too early but someone else had suggested Wednesday earlier I think uh, next Monday uh, special meeting just to deal with uh, getting a bylaw before us that is in final form rather than waiting to September 14th and then revising the bylaw is sufficient time. That's a good seven days. Uh, the the other concern I have is that when we did the smoking bylaw, I mean, you've, you've got to, it's great to say, as in most of our bylaws, it's effective immediately, but that's where you've already done the proper uh, notices on the bylaws, which isn't being done here. Uh, and I'm concerned that the education portion isn't addressed at all. Um, there's no no time to get signs uh, in every uh, location. Um, th those are the kind of things we did with the smoking bylaw, and we uh, we spaced out the enforcement of it uh, as a result of trying to get people educated and also get signs in place so they knew. Uh, not everybody. I mean, I know it's amazing to a lot of us uh, right involved in this meeting but the entire community doesn't listen to these council meetings. Uh, and they apparently understand from social media different things that is actually happening sometimes. So it's good to get the signs out. It's good to have it, uh, have things uh, transparent. And um, I, just, I just worry about this coming back again on the 14th to add other items to a bylaw when we could probably have it all done uh, by uh, Monday the 17th of August. So those are my concerns, and I want to make sure if we, as I've said many, many times, if you're going to do it, do it right. Um, and when we rush at things, we end up with messes, uh, and I've seen them. I don't even need to recite all of them, <laughs> but uh, I think I think it's the best way, best thing to do is is to do it right. Take a deep breath and uh, make the decision uh, in the best interest of the majority of the community and not stick our fingers up in the air testing the wind and seeing how many uh, emails are for and against. Um, I, 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 I prefer that we, uh, I, don't know, I don't even know how I can bring a motion to have this uh, heard on the uh, Monday um, until this one uh, is um, either approved or disapproved. It, but I certainly think that Coming back September 14th, discussing some of these items that the medical officer of health has, has addressed, uh, it would be better to get them addressed early and get it out of the way uh, by next Monday. I hope others agree. Ms. Hoffman has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in the event that the legal team has to take the current draft bylaw back to examine additional edits as been discussed here this evening, they are likely to need a couple of weeks time to be able to do that uh, alongside of the other legal files that uh, you've heard earlier this evening that they've been working on. And into this, in addition to that, uh, and Dr. Rita can weigh in on this, but I suspect likely she would also like a little bit of time to be able to 
prepare a report if, if that's which if that's where council ultimately goes uh, only to say that both of which would be very difficult to bring back in time for Monday and do justice to thank you mr. chair anything else uh, councillor Salmon uh, am I unmuted now yes yeah. that's the comments that uh, Ms. Hoffman just made, I guess, are in line with what I said. You're, um, if it's going to be difficult to have those kind of reports by next Monday, it's it's equally difficult to make a decision uh, today without that kind of a report. Um, we only received this on uh, in draft on the weekend. Um, I, th I think council deserves to get things in sufficient time in order to make good decisions. Um, and I'm not blaming anyone, uh, but we sure didn't get it this time. And uh, I'd like to make this on a very logical, rational, rather than emotional uh, decision. Okay, okay thanks, Councillor Salmon. Uh, Councillor Oche. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I have a few questions, I guess, and a few statements. Uh, one, I know we've had a fairly large outbreak here in my ward um, close to the town that I live in and uh, um, I'm just wondering what is being done about that um, do are we having people go out and charging these people that are having large gatherings that are more than a hundred and they're not social distancing um, because uh, th these same people are coming to Tilbury to do grocery shopping, to shop at stores, to uh, get fuel, to eat dinner. Uh, so that's one reason uh, that I believe that we should have a mask. And I'm not sure who I would ask on that. Uh, are these people being charged? Are we laying charges? Is it Chatham Kent's responsibility? Is it the health board? Uh, can anyone answer that for me? So, uh, Councillor, this is Dave Taylor, the Manager of Legal Services. I would just warn that uh, discussions about individual enforcement mechanism or individual enforcement processes is probably not something uh, to be dealt with in uh, open session of Council. Uh, there's a number of different decisions that need to be made in deciding whether to pre proceed forward with charges on any individual file, and I'm not in charge of uh, enforcement, so I can uh, refer that over to uh, Dr. Redake or anybody else who might want to comment, but I just do give that caution. Okay, thank you. Uh, secondly, I had a complaint about these same people this past weekend with uh, another parking lot being full and uh, being packed. Um, so I'm not sure, maybe I'll speak to, if I could, April after the meeting or tomorrow morning or something, uh, um, depending what time this meeting goes to. Um, secondly, we have, obviously, we're the closest to the border of Windsor, Essex, Leamington, Lakeshore. Uh, we have tons of people coming here again, and this is great for the uh, grocery stores, I guess. Um, because they do not like to wear masks in their area so they come here shopping um, going out for dinner um, but it's not necessarily good for our population here as far as uh, coming from a was a hot spot anyways i guess we're the hot spot now um, so to me uh, masks make sense uh, and i i know you're gonna hear all you hear all kinds of people saying well they don't work while well, they do start stop saliva um from people speaking and accidentally spitting or uh, sneezing or coughing um, so um i guess uh that's where I, i'm gonna leave it uh, i think this is uh, a good start and we can add to it as needed um obviously uh if the moh uh believes with this and the other he, I mean, he's already talking about um, social distancing, physical distancing, and this is supposed to be happening at the moment. Uh, um, so um, I definitely, could, we can add this as needed, and uh, um, I just hope that uh, we do see that there, it may not 
stop at 100 but every little bit can help it can only help and uh I believe uh, Dr. Colby even said that as well himself. So that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. Okay, prior to passing over to Councillor B. McGregor for final comments, I have a few thoughts. Uh, the Certainly, as everyone's emphasized, this has been a polarizing thing in the community. I've never seen so many people uh, being adamant about one opinion versus the other. When we look across one of the big drivers is that we're one of the last communities to decide to make it uh, mask, masking required. And uh, you're right, it is a lot of political decisions being made out there. Uh, I'm guessing most of those decisions weren't based on the medical officer of health saying, yes, let's do this. It was political decisions for various other reasons. So when I look at this, we are, we're one of the last ones. We need, it's about public safety. Like it, it's a psychological safety, it's a physical safety, it's those type of things, mat wearing masks. And a lot of people will feel better wearing masks or having other people wear it. The preventative measures, we can't lose track of that. If we pass this tonight, the, the, as Dr. Colby points out, the critical pieces are social distancing. If everyone practiced social distancing, the, the issues would virtually go away. That's one of the key things. So uh, what my fear is and what Dr. Colby's fear was is that by wearing masks, people are going to say, oh, great, uh, I'm protected now. No, we're not protected completely. And that's why part of the, all this is that if we pass this tonight, we need whether we do or don't, we need to uh, make sure we get education out there what proper masking is. I've seen people walking around with masks below their nose not doing anything, or you wear a very loose mask, those type of things. So we need to, if we're gonna start wearing masks, we need to make sure that we're doing it properly. And again, it's about the psychology of wearing masks as well. I mean, there's some negative to it as well, but there's positive. And the timing of it, we can't wait longer to pass a bylaw. If we're gonna do it, we need to do it now. So I will be supporting this motion. And uh, I, I don't want, Dr. Colby will not be taking this as a slide. Him and I have chatted about this an awful lot, realizing that there's a medical and, and there's political decisions. And a lot of this is political, but it's certainly medical if it can help at all. As Councillor Harrigan pointed out, said if it can prevent one case, it's worth it. So with that, I'll pass over to Councillor B. McGregor for final thoughts. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Um, I, I definitely appreciate all the comments around uh, the virtual table. Um, and I just wanted to, to be really clear that this is in no way about overriding uh, Dr. Colby. Uh, uh, Councillor Solomon mentioned it and he was right that uh, in reiterating that Dr. Colby was supportive of a bylaw with the inclusion of other preventative measures and it was it was with that um, that discussion with Dr. Colby uh, that I um, added the second part of this this motion and uh, under the you know, advisement of, uh, of Mr. Taylor that likely that couldn't be done immediately and, and would, would take some more time so I think it's important to note that this is in no way overriding or taking away from uh, the work that Dr. Colby is doing and his opinion on the value of social distancing, built space, and hand washing. We all know that those are uh, the most important aspects uh, of primary prevention and something that we need to continue uh, to, to do well in our community. Uh, there, there isn't a doubt that this is a challenging decision and, it, and it's one of many that, that we've had to make and likely will we'll still need to make. And uh, I understand it isn't ideal doing this virtually. It's not ideal uh, having to bring it forward with a two thirds vote without the typical um, notice that we have. And I, I don't think it's surprising to feel the frustration uh, of my colleagues being put in this position to make a decision. Um, uh, I just did want to mention, Councillor McGregor had mentioned Alpha, the group that represents local public health units. And I think they anticipated this challenge and that's why they, they were pushing for a, a provincial wide mandate from the provincial government. Um, but as we know, that didn't happen. So like a number of other municipalities, including our very close neighbors in London and Sarnia, uh, it has become a council decision and other councils have made that decision. And, and that's very much why this is not something that's, um, I don't think it's accurate to describe it as being done on the fly. We've got some really good uh, examples to look at. Um, we have what is, I think, a very simple and consistent bylaw with our neighbors um, that's, been, that's been put forward. And I think that uh, it makes sense that we can take this step tonight and that we can ensure we're taking the proper steps in the future, relying on our, our public health team to do uh, continue to do an excellent job with education around all of the important preventative practices. 
And, and with that, uh, I thank you um, for entertaining this motion tonight and uh, I'm hopeful for your support. Uh, okay, uh, prior to vote, uh, Councillor Thompson, uh, you emailed that you're looking for a, uh, a uh, roll call vote. Did you want that or can we go ahead with the normal voting? No, we can go ahead with the normal voting. It's fine. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll uh, put it to vote. And one more person. I will just let council know Councillor Bondi has lost connection, so there are only 17 councillors at this time. Okay, all votes are in. Motion passes. Okay, so we'll go back to the agenda and we're on 10B, procedural bylaw amendments regarding electronic council meetings. Uh, Councillor Harrigan, they each put this on the floor. Uh, yes, and then I do have a couple of questions. Okay, and Councillor Foss, can I get you to second this, please? Uh, so seconded. Okay, uh, Councillor Harrigan, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, through the mayor to Ms. Hoffman, I was just hoping to ask publicly the questions I had asked over email regarding um, the online meetings that we're having. So I just want to recognize that there's an ongoing challenge in um, ongoing meetings, online meetings. I think we're all doing the best that we can, but um, it does lessen the effectiveness of public participation and debate. So can you please speak to, um, not necessarily this bylaw, but what it is that staff may be thinking of in terms of our transition back or what we're going to do in the future, given that we're in phase three. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So right now we're collecting some information uh, on two fronts. Uh, number one here at the Civic Center, as you know, where it's a large building that houses a couple of hundred uh, staff. We have been in the process of getting feedback from our staff with respect to their experiences working remotely, what's been effective and not, and what they would need to see in place moving forward, as well as the employees that continued to work uh, from the office uh, while, we were, while we've been going through this past many months. As you can appreciate, as we start to open our facilities back up, there are a number of precautions that we need to take and protocols that we need to ensure that are in place so that we are, um, making sure that we're meeting our requirements at law in terms of uh, you know, social distancing and those kinds of things, but also protocols that we put in place to make sure that we are keeping things clean, that we're keeping things signed and uh, sending off areas that are prohibited to the public, et cetera. So along with this, we're also currently preparing uh, to get some feedback from council as well. Uh, many of you have spoken with us informally to talk about your interest in either returning or your interest in, in not returning as soon as we are all able to. Uh, our intention is to take the feedback that we receive from both groups and mesh them together. We're going to, out of that, develop a strategy for when we may be able to start to return slowly uh, into a council chambers. I don't expect that to be until sometime into the fall. Uh, and But I do hope that within the course of the next couple of weeks that we will have all the feedback and at least uh, know the a little with a little bit more fine point on it what that timing will look like maybe last comment to that and then i'll stop is uh, that we've also we're just about finished our complete reopening uh, document strategy which outlines every single protocol that we need to think about relative to you know traffic flows the way people move through buildings uh, all of the kinds of things that need to be considered and council meetings have been one of them the clerk's office has been working diligently on trying to think of what all might need to be in place to be able to accommodate both council uh, staff and the public I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm 
very happy to hear that we are considering very seriously the implications to returning to in-person meetings uh, and just wanted to make the public aware of that. So no further questions. Thank you, Your, uh, Mayor Caniff. Okay, seeing, uh, seeing no other questions, we'll put it to vote. Council, just as an FYI, there is a requirement of a two-thirds uh, approval on this one because it is the procedural bylaw and that's how the procedural bylaw is written. So we will have to make sure that uh, it is at least 66%. Okay, all votes are in. Motion passes. Uh, next item is 10D, Wallaceburg Kinsman Hall Club. Councillor Hall and Councillor C. McGregor, can I get you to put it on the floor, please? Yes, Mayor Ken, if I have a motion to make from the uh, from the report. And yes, I'm happy to uh, to uh, put it on the floor. Thank you. Okay, to you, Councillor Hall, you have the floor. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Mayor Caniff. Um, let me see here. Uh, I would like to move that the municipality of Chatham can continue to provide booking services to the Wallsburg Kinsman Club for bookings for the Wallsburg Kinsman Recreation and Community Center, and further all necessary user agreements be prepared and signed by staff, and further staff consult with the Wallsburg Kinsman Club on an ongoing basis to help mitigate cost. And I would and also, I would like to second that, please. Okay, Councillor Hall, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, just to uh, uh, just like to thank staff for preparing this report, um, and I believe all of council received an email from Councillor Carmen McGregor, uh, which was forwarded to us by the Wallsford Kinsman Club after they had a special club meeting on Saturday after we made them aware of the report that was coming to council this evening. Just to kind of summarize, the Wallsford Kinsman Club's Recreation and Community Center is a absolute vital asset to the community of Wallaceburg. The agreement that has been in place between the Kinsmen and the municipality has enabled the Kinsmen to work with countless other community groups and organizations in our community. Uh, their gym facility is used by lacrosse teams to train, baseball teams to do off-season training, cheerleading groups, um, and even a group of old washed up basketball players that uh, uh, sometimes I'm a part of as well, so I have no I'll take the flack for that when we, whenever we get the chance to go back. Um, but needless to say, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, community groups and organizations and a lot of different uh, demographics, a lot of it geared towards youth um, and uh, all the way up to seniors. So uh, to me, and in, in, in the opinion of the Wallsford Kinsmen, who are, who are an absolute, a group of dedicated volunteers and community leaders um, in our community, uh, the time and effort and collaboration with the municipality on this agreement, it is unique, um, but it is absolutely worth the investment and provides benefits to our community that would be difficult to monetize, monetize or put a number to. Um, the Kinsmen are hoping to continue providing this tremendous service for our community. Uh, and as I said in the motion as well, not only uh, continue the collaborating with the municipality, but working with them to help mitigate any, any staff time or costs. So I'd be thankful for council support tonight as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, seeing no other questions on this, we'll put it to vote. Council, we have limited number of motions that we're allowed to put into the system. So because this is a new motion that uh, we um, don't have it recorded in there. So we'll just have to do a show of hands of who's opposed, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, do we want to do a, a roll call or a show of hands for against? We can do a roll call and that way we okay. can record it in the minutes. Why don't we do a roll call? It's uh, easier than trying to ask uh, people to, step, to speak up. So go ahead. Sure, I'll go alphabetically. Councillor Oche? With regards to the motion that's on the screen. Yep, I'm for it. Thank you. Bondi? Oh, sorry, Bondi is not available. Uh, Councillor Sakachi? In favor. Crew? In favor. Boss? Yes. Finn? No. Hall? Yes. 
Harrigan? Yes. Kirkwood White? Yes. Vladimir? Yes. McGrail? Yes. Uh, Brock McGregor? In favor. Uh, Carmen McGregor? In, fa in favor. Thank you. Pinsano? Yes. Salmon? No. Thompson? Yes. Yes. Uh, Wright? Yes. Uh, Caniff? No. Okay, all votes are in. Uh, it is 14 to 3 in favor. Okay, moving to the next um, report, 11A, Application for Site Plan Control, Ridge Chatham Holdings LP, uh, 20111 and 20262 Erio Road, Community of Harwich. And we have just pulled this one due to a conflict by Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor Solomon and Councillor McGrail, can I get you put, the two of you to put it on the floor, please? I'll move it. Second, Ed. Uh, any questions? Seeing none, we'll put it to vote. A couple more. We're still waiting for a couple more counselors. Okay, all votes are in. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to the next one. It is 11, sorry, 13A. Update on May 4th, 2020, recommendations number six, opportunities and programs available to Lake Erie shoreline property owners. Uh, Councillor Harrigan and Councillor Foss, can I get you put on the floor, please? Uh, yes, and I have uh, an alternate motion as well. I'll second it. Okay, uh, the floor is yours, Councillor Harrigan. Okay, thank you. I had. Um, sent the wording in advance. Um, so I would like to receive the report and move that staff prepare a communication to residents on the use of local improvement charges under Ontario Regulation 58606, that the communication should outline any resident fees, processes, and recommendations based on the ZUZAC report. And that staff, or that CK staff prepare a series of local information sessions to be held virtually or in each of the areas identified within the ZUZAC report communicating the area specific issues and recommendations from the report. These information sessions should be complete by the end of the calendar year in 2021. Uh, Councillor Foss, or, oh, sorry, can I get a seconder for that? Councillor Foss? Yeah, that's fine, thank you. Okay, Councillor Harrigan, comments? Uh, so thank you, Mayor Kinnick. Just really quickly, as the report outlines, I had identified um, a number six to some recommendations based on the ZUZAC report. And I believe what staff have provided here is um, a very excellent start on resources for community members, especially those looking to understand what the impact of the ZUZAC report is or, or potentially what uh, next steps they may take as homeowners. Um, but further to that, the report mentions um, some some more complex mechanisms for support in local improvements, which include the ability for um, homeowners to gather in groups to do um, prepare or to do enhancements around their shoreline. And um, you know, we had talked about potential financial support programs that are available. 
and uh, Mr. Kelly has shared with me and the report outlines that this is something that is available to residents and I think we need to do um, a bit more work in communicating what that looks like to them. So uh, hoping Councillor can support this as part of our uh, Councillor priorities to improve our community engagement. I think this really again goes a long way in doing so. Seeing no other questions, we'll vote it to vote. Sorry, councillors, waiting for two more again. All votes are in. Motion passes. The next agenda item is 13E, which is the sale of 540 Park Ave East Unit 5 Chatham, construction of new public works garage. And we had to bring this one forward as a, there was a conflict by Councillor Solman. Uh, Councillor Kirkwood White and Councillor Crew, can I get you to put this on the floor, please? So moved. I'll second it. Okay, seeing no questions, we'll put it to vote. All votes are in. Motion passes. Moving on to finance, budget, information, technology, and transformation. 14A, multi-year budgeting. Uh, Councillor uh, Latimer and Councillor B. McGregor, can I get you to put this in the floor, please? So moved. Uh, so seconded. Okay, the floor is yours, Councillor Latimer. Uh, through the mayor, could I ask Gord Quinton just to review um, with regard to perceived disadvantages and for those who are listening, uh, how what the annual review process would look like? Um, I've had a couple of questions coming from constituents with regard to the fact that this may be, um, uh, you know, viewing the current unrest and the economic client. They, they really didn't feel this was appropriate. But I, I think there's... Uh, there's information in the report that perhaps uh, people don't realize uh, with regard to the um, annual, the ability to annually review what we put in place every four years. So, Gord, if you could give your two, your chime in here, I'd be appreciative. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Canop. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Stephen Brown, the Director of Budget and Performance Services, uh, respond to that. Thanks. Thanks, Gord. As Gord said, uh, I'm Steve Brown, Director of Budget and Performance Services. Uh, so when you look at the, the annual review process, there is flexibility that Council has uh, within the multi-year budget to open up a budget um, and make modifications or changes. As an example, with the current pandemic, um, you know, one of the items and as, as a reason to be able to open the multi-year budget is unanticipated changes to economic forecasts. So with the ongoing pandemic, that would be a perfect example of a reason why we would be opening the budget. Um, and the, the multi-year budget may not stand as, as approved. Um, so when you're looking at the different reasons to be able to open up the budget, changes to council priorities, uh, the external factors. Uh, so last year, for example, we had um, some provincial uh, downloading that we had to take up that would have been covered off by that area. Um, we have the unanticipated changes to economic forecasts, and then also the changes to budgets resulting from the annual service review process, which would be a focus um, of the budget team in years two through four on the budget cycle. Thank you very much. I, I, I uh, myself feel that the advantages of the uh, multi-year budgeting far away the disadvantages particularly with regard to new council members and the fact that we can tie it specifically to, to our strategic priorities and accounts which change every four years so thank you very much i appreciate it. i look forward to um 
the future reports. Uh, Councillor C. McGregor followed by Councillor B. McGregor. Um, thank you, and I just want to, to thank Steve and his department and Gord for the detailed report. I thought that it was uh, very good at addressing all of all of the different things and even the savings that, that maybe could be sought um, by going to a multi-year budgeting. Um, I, I felt that by by the report that came out to us, there was that we were not jumping into things rashly. There's lots of time to look at it, and we've had the opportunity for our financial department to look at it. And uh, I, I think, you know, I'm not going to say too much more. I was, uh, after our last budget session, I, I couldn't help thinking, or maybe the last two budget sessions, how much uh, and the difficulty that we go through, especially when a new council comes in and dealing with a brand new budget. It is a very big budget, and there is a lot to understand. And I thought by having a year under your belt, gives everybody a really good opportunity to learn the workings of the municipality that affect the budget. So um, hence why I brought this in, in the first place. So, um, but I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Councillor B. McGregor, um, because I know through, through conversation and such, he has talked to some local people and, and has talked about realizing some savings and different things. So I would like to turn it over to him. He is our budget chair. And, uh, and I would thank him also for giving me the, the ability to bring this uh, motion in the first place because it might normally have come from him and I maybe have jumped over or overstepped my bounds originally uh, in bringing this motion. So I'd like to turn it over to Councillor B. McGregor. Sorry, just to have my mic on. Uh, uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Stephen Gregor, and uh, through your Mayor Kenneth. Uh, yeah, I was really pleased uh, that Councillor Stephen Gregor brought this motion um, and uh, had the opportunity to learn a bit about it. I did, uh, through you, want to ask uh, either Gord or Steve if you can maybe speak to the feedback uh, that you received from, uh, maybe in particular from London, uh, in, in talking about uh, the advantages of a multi year budget and uh, maybe their corporate experience. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the feedback that we received from London, so we talked to individuals within the uh, budget department there, and um, so they've just now actually just gone through and approved in March, early March, their second multi-year budget. Um, and the feedback that we've received from them, it was, it was a very positive experience. Um, it was very, uh, it was well accepted. Um, they're, you know, being, being able to focus on the service reviews throughout years two through four um, to be able to find savings to either implement additional um, council priorities or to look at reducing the tax rate, um, you know, were highlights as well that they mentioned. So I do think overall it was, um, you know, they were very positive about the, the switch to a multi-year budget. Uh, and then also highlighting the fact that doing it on uh, for the January 1st of Council's second year is probably the best bet and that's sort of the, the general consensus that we received um, when we're looking at other municipalities mainly out west and within London that did that. Yeah, and that, uh, I, I reached out to the uh, budget chair in London, uh, Councillor Morgan, and uh, he, he shared the same experience uh, politically and said that it was uh, an opportunity he felt uh, to be more educated about some of the base budget items and offered uh, some real opportunity on off years uh, to find savings and that they had found that um, to be a really uh, favorable change um, from their understanding of the budget process and uh, allowed for a little bit more long-term certainty. So, um, you know, after hearing uh, their experience and, and reading through this report, I'm very supportive of uh, moving to the multi-year budget uh, strategy. Uh, okay, Councillor Harrigan. Hi, thank you, Mary Kenneth. Um, through uh, to staff, uh, I'm just wondering if you could give context to any changes that this may mean for taxpayers, if at all. So, for example, if we approve a two percent budget increase in a multi-year budget, how how does that play out? Is that a one-time two percent increase, or is that year over year? Just so that uh, 
taxpayers have an understanding of what that means for their tax bills. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So for the taxpayer, I guess the predictability of the tax rate increase uh, over the next four years would be the best, um, you know, one of the, the main benefits as long as well as any savings derived from the service review process. So with your example of an increase of 2%, that would be an increase of 2% year over year um, for the for the four year period. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. That's the only question I had. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, we'll put it to vote. Okay, all votes are in. Motion passes. The next report is 14B, June 2020, budget variance forecast. Councillor Harrigan and Councillor Pinsonel, can I get you to put it on the floor, please? Happy to do so. Second. Okay, uh, Councillor Harrigan, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, happy to review the report and see the details. So thank you for that to, to Mr. Clinton. Recently, the province provided announcements, um, not just for municipalities, but also for areas like childcare. Can you speak to uh, specifically to municipal funding that was announced? I think now it was maybe two weeks ago for COVID-19. If we have heard anything, any updates about it, or if we can anticipate what that timeline would be? Thank you, Mayor Caniff. It's Gord Quinton, uh, Chief Financial Officer speaking. Um, so yes, there was an announcement of a, of a deal, the, the say free restart deal between the federal government and the province. And what that meant for the province of Ontario is a $4 billion for municipalities. 2 billion is earmarked for the uh, transit sector, which you could imagine that uh, you know, most of that's going to towards the, the, the GTHA area and uh, Ottawa and major cities, uh, we will get a uh, nominal amount out of that uh, based on ridership, but it won't be that substantial. The other two billion uh, that they're divvying out to municipalities across Ontario, all 444 municipalities, uh, the, the province is still determining what rationale they're going to use. So uh, the easiest, of course, is by population, uh, but they may uh, add some other wrinkles to that, especially I could see dealing with uh, some of the uh, highest need area that had a direct impact. So whether it's um, uh, long-term care homes, PPE, uh, our ambulance ser service, things like that. So they haven't come out with those details. Uh, and um, the timing uh, where I expect it to come is during the AMO Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference, which is coming up uh, a week from Sunday, it begins. That's where I really expect the announcements to come out is in the few days of the AMO conference, where we'll actually get, Chatham Kent will actually get its allocation letter and, and some more details will be be known. So it's a, it's quite a guess right now. Uh, you know, I uh, based on population, I, I've, you know, I have my estimates of what we will get, but but it's it's probably better rather than putting those numbers out there is to wait and 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 see what our actual allocation is as as it's only about ten days away from receiving it. Great, thank you. That was my only question. Seeing no other questions, we'll put it to vote. All votes are in. Motion passes. 
the next report is 14C, Small Business Recovery Grants. And I understand that administration, Matt Torrance, has uh, something to advise council of with regards to the recommendation. Thank you, Judy. <clears throat> we're we're uh, proposing to modify the recommendation slightly. Um, one of the program requirements was that applicants had to be current on their taxes as of March 1st. Um, there are a few successful applicants for which the property they have listed is in arrears. Most of these are landlord tenant relationships and we need to confirm the relationship between the landlord and the tenant. Um, we don't want to penalize the tenant for a landlord being in arrears, but often businesses set up different companies, often number companies for real estate holdings. So once we confirm an arm's length relationship between the landlord and the tenant, we will release the grant. Okay, uh, Councillor Kirkwood White and Councillor Harry, can you each put on the floor, please? Yes, uh, so moved. And seconded. Okay, Councillor Harrigan. Um, thank you. So I just to clarify what Matt had just shared with us that if there is a tenant who resides in a property that's in arrears, we are still going to grant that tenant the grant, right? We're not going to penalize is what you had said. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, I just very quickly wanted to share with council that I um, took note of the businesses in my ward that were, are receiving grants and I had reached out to one of them as a heads up that they're on the recommendation. Um, and they replied to me with a, a photo of themselves in tears um, and said to me that uh, I had no idea how many sleepless nights that they had lately and to please thank every darn counselor and the mayor for me. So it really was impactful for me how far these grants are going and uh, I'm very pleased to see the amount. I think that's a substantial amount for a small business who's really looking to make ends meet. So thank you for staff um, and to the Economic Recovery Task Force for the work that they put into this. Uh, Councillor Kirkwood White, then Councillor Pinsonal. Thank you very much, Your Worship. I uh, have a related question. Uh, for the last several weeks, there have been full page ads in the newspapers and on social media promoting Canada United. Local businesses need your business. Show local some love. And this has been initiated by the Royal Bank. I had a question uh, related to this, either from Jamie Rainbird or Stu McFadden, to see whether there was any uh, linkage between this particular program that might support our local small businesses and if they've heard anything uh, through the Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. It's Stu McFadden, Director of Economic Development. Uh, yes, we are aware of this program. Uh, this is something that their local Chamber of Commerce has been promoting heavily. Uh, we spoke with them during the last uh, Economic Recovery Task Force meeting and, and uh, made a commitment that we will uh, continue to support this. Uh, if you go on to InvestCK and uh, click on Economic Development, you'll see that it's on our main page. Uh, applications open on August 31st, and we would encourage any and all businesses in Chatham-Kent to uh, make applications. They uh, meet the criteria set out. Every dollar is an important dollar and we will support this so wholeheartedly through all of our social media platforms that we have through the Economic Development Department. Thank you, Stu. Councillor Pinsano followed by Councillor Sakachi. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I had a couple of businesses uh, that were going to apply for it but didn't have their taxes paid up to date, so they didn't. So just to clarify, any of these uh, property owners that run their business and they own the property but don't have their taxes paid will not be eligible. Is that correct? Thank you, Mayor Caniff. If they own the property and they own the business and they're in arrears, they will not be eligible. If they own the business and rent the property from another landlord who is in arrears, we won't hold that against them and we'll still issue the grant. We just need to confirm uh, the lease arrangements and that the, the, the the property owner and the business are not related. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, just because I did have a couple of businesses ask about it, but they were in arrears on their taxes and said that they you know, couldn't apply for it because of that. So it's a fair play and field. Thank you. Councillor Scotchy. Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. I just wanted to appreciate all the hard work that went into, uh, you know, all the, the volunteers on 
committee, the task force, sorry, and all the staff, um, as well as this this um, this amendment here. I think that that really does uh, uh, help a lot of businesses that may not uh, you know have qualified due to something that uh, is undue hardship uh, from somebody else. And, and I really do think that for small businesses, uh, this is you know enough money to at least help them. Uh, at least for a month or so to, to recover and i just wanted to appreciate uh, all the people that had any kind of hand in the matter so thank you for your, for your time seeing no other questions we'll put it to vote All votes are in. Motion passes. Next item is 14D, 2019 Use of Contracted Professional Services. I have Councillor Latimer with a conflict. Uh, Councillor Harrigan and Councillor Scotchy, and each two of you put it on the floor, please. Yes, happy to move it. Happy to second it, Your Worship. Uh, the floor is yours, Councillor Harrigan. I don't believe I pulled this one. I have no oh. comment. All right. Well, that's even better. Uh, we can uh, put it to vote then. With this one, we can just do a show of hands. Can everybody put their hand up in the room? I'm, I'm kidding. Anybody opposed? Hearing none, uh, it's, it's carried. Okay, and now we'll move on to 14i, Support for Tech Savvy Solutions, Inc., Improving Connectivity for Ontario Program ICON Application. And this one I have a conflict by Councillor Salmon. Uh, Councillor McGrail and Councillor Foss, can I get the two of you to put it on the floor, please? So moved. So seconded. Okay, seeing no questions, we'll put it to, to vote. All votes are in. Motion passes. Uh, Councillor Kirk, oh. Uh, next is 14J, 2021 Budget Opportunities for 0%. Uh, Councillor Kirkwood-White uh, and Councillor Latimer, can I get the two of you to put on the floor, please? So moved. Seconded. Okay, the floor is yours, Councillor Kirkwood-White. Yes, I had a uh, an additional recommendation uh, to be inserted between item number one and item number two. I believe I sent it uh, through to Judy this afternoon or this morning, and there it is. Um, actually looking for an opportunity, given the fact that this uh, provides an opportunity for the municipality to uh, explore potential partnerships, the wording in 1A, speaks to uh, identifying and or partnering with local nonprofits or small businesses which are providing similar services with a view to reducing and or eliminating potential duplication as part of the Council whole exercise. Council Latimer, are you okay with the uh, revision? Certainly. Am. Okay. Uh, any questions, uh, Councillor Harrigan and Councillor Pinsano? Hi, Mayor Kenneth, thank you. Um, I would like to move that we vote on recreation facilities separately in the chart. I personally think that this council has demonstrated in the past and will likely continue to demonstrate no appetite for service reviews of arenas. And I would also include um, parks and outdoor spaces. I think as we develop our community um, into a, a healthy community and a well community. We need to prioritize our parks and open spaces and 
Um, and I would hate to send staff the wrong message or to have staff spend time on an area that will not be approved in the future. Sorry, Councilor Harrigan, to clarify, it's in the appendix of the report, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, uh, we'll, we're just looking into that. Maybe we'll go to Councillor Pinsano while we're, while uh, the clerk is looking this up. Uh, thank you, Worship. I agree with Councillor Harrigan on that. There's no sense in wasting the staff time because we don't have the appetite to uh, to remove any of that. That's great. Um, I guess my question through to administration, I'm not sure you can answer. How much more work is this going to require for this addition that's being put in? Uh, thank you, Mayor, Mayor Kenneth. Uh, just clarifying the question, how much more work for... for for council to ex or for your administration to explore opportunities with the nonprofits and small businesses. Oh, uh, thank you for the clarification. Um, uh, I, I do. Not, I don't think it's that uh, onerous of uh, of task. Uh, there are some programs that have been identified where we're perhaps in competition with private or not other nonprofit private uh, businesses or other our nonprofit businesses. So um, it will add uh, some additional work to reach out to those groups. But uh, in most cases, those are known groups where we know that other businesses are providing a similar service. Okay, thank you, Gord. I'm done. Councilor Harrigan, just to go back to yours, so I have uh, pages one and two for the Appendix A. Is there a specific line of, or are they the, both the rec facility one and the rec services one? Um, no, on page two, the second last row of chart is IES recreation facilities. Okay, that so one you like want voted remove, on separately. Yes, or, or I can move to remove it from the recommendation if that's easier, whatever's easier. Okay. We'll just need a second to get that written up. Excuse me, Judy, is that going to be part of the main motion then? So one way we can handle this is if it's in a friendly amendment um, to remove it completely, or we can vote as on that as the amendment first, and then if it passes, then we can vote on the whole motion as amended with that removal. I'm not comfortable with the uh, friendly amendment because I think we okay. need to look at everything. Sure, okay, so what we can do is we'll put that motion first on the floor as an amendment to remove the IES rec facility line in the appendix. If it passes, then we'll vote on the main motion as amended, and if it fails, we'll just vote on the main motion as it was originally presented. Okay. Makes sense to me. Mayor is just having some microphone uh, difficulties right now, so we are just trying to straighten him out.
Okay. So what we're going to do, uh, they're still working on his microphone. Uh, what we're going to do is we, um, like I said earlier, we don't have any more uh, voting ones. So we are going to do roll call on the amendment. And the amendment will be on the screen. Thank you, Meredith. <laughs> All right. So I, can you hear me now? Okay. So I see four hands up. Any of those want to talk about the what's on the screen now? Give you an opportunity to just take your hand off. I'll assume that all of everyone wants to talk about the motion that's on there. Okay, uh, so Councillor B. McGregor followed by Councillor Sulman. Thank you, Mayor Tanif. Um, uh, in, in reviewing this report, I, I did suspect that uh, this would be uh, one of the items that was perhaps the most contentious, and there are a number on there. I do think uh, it's important to note that these aren't decisions uh, that are being made tonight about how we're going to change services or, or use of facilities, but rather um, is looking at getting more information on these for November. And while I you know, understand that uh, that's, that's quite sensitive, I think there is a responsibility that we, that uh, regardless of what decision we know we will make with some of these uh, topics, that we understand what those costs are. And I think that that's what um, uh, the public ex expects. Uh, certainly, I understand how how difficult that is, and you know I wouldn't commit to to um, you know how I would uh, treat some of these recommendations when we see them in November. But I I do think it's appropriate to um, to do our due diligence and uh, at least understand what we're looking at in terms of cost. Okay, Councillor Solomon, followed by Councillor Sakachi. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm trying to reconcile these uh, met, uh, recommendations with the um, uh, deputations that we had earlier. Uh, and might ask through the clerk, I'm, I'm using two different screens here in virtual land, and I'm trying to reconcile what uh, Mr. Um, who did we have? Mr. Grail and Mr. Uh, who else did we have? Judy. Yes, so we had with regard to that report, which is 14 J, we had Mike Grail, we had Bill Lopes, and we had Gail Hunt. Okay, All thank with you. Regards to that one. So the question I had was the original motion, uh, and I don't see it on the screen anymore, but it was uh, with respect to an analysis. And their suggestion was that it had to be an independent analysis, not a staff analysis to get, um, there we go, further analysis. But my recollection is their recommendation uh, was that it be an independent analysis and that they'd uh, find ways to pay for it themselves. Am I correct in my recollection of what uh, Mr. Lokes, et cetera, said? Uh, thank you, Mayor Canna. Uh, Councillor Solomon, yes, that's what um, uh, Mr. Lux said that they're they're willing to uh, step up if council wished uh, to have um, any outside consultant help on any specific issue that you like them to that you think we needed ex external assistance on. So uh, you know. In, in the report under uh, IES engineering on uh, page two, we were indicating that that might be an ideal uh, place where getting some outside assistance to speed up our look at uh, core versus non-core infrastructure might be a, uh, a topic that, uh, first of all, has a lot of dollars, budget dollars attached to it. And, uh, it may maybe that they were able to come up with uh, more standard metrics on on how to measure whether to keep a facility or structure uh, in, being repaired and replaced or or when to dispose and de decommission an asset so that that was one of our our suggestions there but but yes they, they are are willing to fund a, a consultant study on whatever council would ch choose to have looked at. But I do want to caution on uh, one, as far as an overall review, um, uh, 
we're getting close to 2021 budget and and to, um, sometimes it can take many months to get a, that consultant work done that um, uh, I, I think on a lot of these issues administration has brought reports in the past and it, it's just an, an issue of updating them and some of these uh, items on this list is actually can be done very quickly with reports come not waiting till November perhaps coming in as early as a September council meeting several of these items yeah. so um, I, I'm hesitant on uh, you know having a, a consultant look at everything because uh, first the cost would go way up up and uh, it would be perhaps too broad broad a scope uh, to get anything back that you likely have already heard from an administration already in the past few years. Yeah, I agree for the 2021 budget and I thank you, uh, your worship uh, through to uh, Mr. Quinn. Uh, but I think you do ultimately get your best objective opinion um, by doing it the way that Mr. Lowe suggested. Um, I am opposed to um, Ms. Harrigan's uh, motion because for, for many reasons, probably not the ones that you think. Um, uh, the public and, and I'm sure council is aware that the uh, we've been turned down for our uh, funding of the uh, mega project, uh, arena project uh, as of today. And that really drives looking at uh, arenas everywhere, including in Ch particularly in Chatham. Uh, so I don't think we can, I, even if you don't want to do things, even if we want everything to remain the same as it was in uh, 1997, um, we're not doing our due diligence if, if we don't examine uh, where things should be changed, where things should improve and where things should progress. I mean, we, we do that with healthcare, we do it with other items. I don't know why we cherry pick and say, no, you can't, you can't look at these things. Um, ultimately, if the majority says, no, we're just gonna stay where we were in 1997, that's fine. But at least the public should know, the taxpaying public should know the facts. So no, I can't, I can't support that uh, amendment. The uh, motion as it's, uh, has been amended by uh, Councillor, uh, Kirkwood White uh, is actually uh, looking at other ways to find savings. And I think that's what we, we we're bound to do. Even if at some point in time, uh, the majority says, no, I don't wanna save, save money in that regard. But uh, at the outset, I think we've got to look at all these. And we'd be, I don't think we're doing our duty if we don't. Those are my comments. So I'm, on, I'm quite happy to support uh, the motion that was brought by Councillor Kirkwood White but uh, the amendment to me certainly is not friendly. It, and it uh, takes a whole uh, sector out that needs to be examined. And not, not just in the rural areas, it needs to be examined in the urban areas too. Okay, uh, Mr. Kelly, you had a comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to comment as well, uh, the fact that we did not get the funding uh, from the Canada Infrastructure Program uh, as you recall, we had put aside some money of our own. We were asking the federal and provincial governments for about 38 million uh, for their level of contribution. And we were going to remove both the Memorial and Ericsson Arena from the inventory. Because of that decision now, um, I personally would ask that it uh, arenas remain on because we have to make some tough decisions with both of those arenas. So our initial estimates were close to if we wanted to just get Memorial back to a decent uh, arena, we're talking about 18 million. The same goes for uh, with Ericsson as well. There's some major issues. So uh, it's not a savings. The discussion we need to have is an investment strategy. So I, I think that needs to come back to council for particularly those two arenas now based on the information we received today. And uh, we'll make some recommendations, but we've got some tough decisions to make on both of those two arenas. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Sakachi followed by Councillor C. McGregor. 
Well, thank you, Mayor Kane. If my actually, I was, was going to have a couple of questions directed to Mr. Kelly in, in the exact regard he uh, just responded to. Um, but just to elaborate a little bit, uh, the discussion already on the, the zero percent is going to going to take staff and uh, you know all parties to analyze uh, all aspects of, of, of the corporation. Um, and although I'm a very very big supporter in you know the recreational facilities, I do think that um, you know we're going to see unprecedented challenges when it comes to uh, the operations of, of all of all aspects of our community. So I think that at the end of the day, I, I do agree with Councillor McGregor and Councillor. So when we are kind of doing a disservice if we don't uh, at least support looking at it, if the council, either it be us or the council of the, of the next term decides to uh, to not support any recommendations that come from you know staffing, I think that they can choose to do so at the time. But uh, unfortunately, I cannot support uh, on that particular um, uh, motion myself. Thank you. Councillor C. McGregor. Thank you, uh, Mayor Kenneth. Um, um, probably want to reiterate uh, a couple of things were said, but uh, I think, um, you know, and I'm not always one to agree with all of the consultants and outside consultants, but I think when it comes to some of this in this area um, that, you know, an outside consultant might give, an, uh, give us an unbiased uh, opinion um and can look at our community in a different through a different lens than maybe what we can because each of us through each of our communities are out to protect our communities so it's very difficult uh, to do that when you know we are elected to represent our communities so that makes it very difficult so you know hence what uh you know councillor Solomon said and and uh uh, I, you know, I think that we need to have a better look at this, and I've requested this, I think, over the years that I think we look at this. So, I, and, and I know a lot of us don't have the appetite to look at, especially arenas, libraries, different things, but I think an outside lens looking at this um, is, is what we as responsible counselors probably need to do, even if it is a matter of hiring a consultant and if we if we can't do it individually because of the large size of our council and the number of communities that we deal with that uh, this might be the opportunity to move forward i don't know that it works for the 2021 budget but you know it might be something that could take place between the 21 and the 22 budget so that uh that there's a presentation especially before we get to multi-year budgeting so um just my thoughts thank you Okay, seeing no other questions on the amendment, we'll put that to vote. Okay, Council. So we that on screen. Yeah, that's what we're. Yeah, that's what we're voting on there. It's on screen now. Okay, Council. So this one is going to have to be a roll call as we have no more spots for motions. So I will start actually alphabetically, but this time I'll start from the bottom up. Okay, Councillor Wright. Yes. Sorry, I should have said Council or Mayor Caniff. No. No. Councilor Thompson. No. Salmon. No. Pince no. Yes. Uh, C McGregor. No. B McGregor. No. McGrail. No. Latimer? No. Kirkwood White? Councilor Kirkwood White? No, sorry. That's okay, thank you. Uh, Harrigan? Yes. Hall? No. Finn? Oh, sorry, she's left the meeting. Um, Foss? No. Crew? No. Takachi? No. Bondi's left the meeting and Oche? Yes. So I have a vote of 4 to 12. Motion fails. And now we'll go to the uh, original motion. Okay. Do I have any questions regarding the original motion? Not seeing any. We'll put it to vote.
Two more, Council. All votes are in. Motion passes. Okay, now we move on to section 15, which is community human services. 15A, COVID-19 response, public health staffing needs. Councillor Harrigan and Councillor C. McGregor, can I get the two of you to put it on the floor, please? Yes, I'd be pleased yes, to okay. put it on the floor. And I'll second. Okay, uh, Councillor Harrigan, you got the floor. Thank you. Just a quick question through to Dr. Redike. Um, regarding the tenure of these positions, can you please make comment on that if you anticipate these will be permanent um, expansions or one time? Through you, Mayor Kenneth. Through you, Mayor Kenneth. Uh, April Redike, General Manager, of Community Human Services. I have Teresa Bendo, Director of Public Health, here uh, in the room with me, and she uh, would be happy to answer Councillor Harrigan's questions. Uh, so thank you for the question, uh, uh, Councillor Harrigan. Uh, no, these would be temporary positions up to um, 12 months. The intent of these positions are to um, kind of uh, help us address kind of the incremental um, staffing needs uh, for what we think will be approximately 12 months to respond to the okay. pandemic. Thank you. Um, I know over the course of the last few budgets, our staffing in public health has been reduced by and large in part, as I understand it, to provincial funding and right setting in terms of the public health funding. Um, and I think that these are important positions to have. And it's also important for us as municipalities to advocate for um, secure, consistent staffing in public health, as we've seen with COVID um, and certainly other pandemics that have you know, we've dealt with in the past and are surely to deal with in the future. Public health resources are important and valuable in having, um, you know, permanent positions within our public health unit allow us to respond in a way that's consistent with staff members that don't need to be trained. So happy to support this. Um, just wanted to make comment that I, I wish there was more public health funding to go around in the province. Okay, seeing no other questions, we'll put it. All votes are in. Motion passes. Last report of the agenda 15C shelter options for Chatham Kent. Councillor Kirkwood White and Councillor Latimer, can I get the two of you to put on the floor, please? So moved. Seconded. Okay, Councillor Kirkwood White, do you have the floor? See, you left the last, the best one till last. Um, I am very pleased to uh, to move these recommendations and extremely pleased with the second part of the recommendation. I understand that there will be some objections to the uh, location for the second temporary uh, homelessness shelter but uh, i'm very pleased to see that uh, the option of indwell is being considered as a long-term housing solution for some of our communities most vulnerable and uh, looking forward to pursuing discussions with uh, april and her team and the local indwell committee that has been visiting and learning over the last year and a half about Indwell. I uh, want to say that uh, there have been a number of deputations with regard to this on both sides of the fence. And uh, as a, an individual who has worked with some of our communities most vulnerable, I think that uh, we are doing a disservice if we don't provide them with the proper shelter that they need. So. Very happy to move this motion. Uh, Councillor Latimer, followed by Councillor OJ. 
thank you through the mayor. Um, uh, Dr. Ryan, or could someone uh, please address uh, the current uh, wave of uh, concern that is then uh, registered with all the counselors if they look at their emails from a neighboring community. Um, I am also very pleased with uh, this recommendation, uh, particularly with number two, the full report on the option of in well, um, and very pleased that you're, although you're looking to increase staffing, uh, you're using provincial dollars, and, but in the same terms, you're looking at Indwell. So that tells me that uh, we as a municipality are following our strategic priority and not uh, sheltering, but housing. But I am concerned about uh, the perception or, or the lack of, uh, of immediate community um, engagement and how we are going to mitigate that going forward with this initiative. Thank so, you. Uh, oh, sorry. Nope, that's fine, Polly. I was just going to introduce you. So go ahead. Um, just in terms of Mayor Caniff, Polly Smith, Director of Employment Social Services, is uh, online um, and can address all of Council's questions. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, April. Um, the, so there's there's a variety of things of things that play and and as you mentioned and is in the report, um, the idea is to house people. So this is um it is meant to be a temporary solution and we have had a different model that we've used successfully in Chatham Kent for recent years. What's happening here in Chatham Kent is uh, happening across the province and across the country, um, with people being turned out into. Um, more visible homelessness than they were previously. Um, the concerns of the community um, are heard and what we did when we moved into the Bradley Center, for example, to help with that was I contacted the neighboring businesses and spoke with them and provided my, my contact information and also gave information on what to do in different scenarios. Um, that is exactly what we would do in this situation. Um, this shelter, there's no zoning changes required. There has been consultations with, with um, a variety of organizations and volunteer groups that we work with through the homelessness task force that um, United Way has put together. Um, so we have been working with a lot of partners and consulting and getting ideas and, and help for, um, you know how to operate we've worked closely with the police um, and we would continue to do you know these same activities to try to blend into the neighborhood um, as best we can i think it's really important for the people in the community to realize that these in, the individuals um, that we see that are suffering that are homeless are all over our community and they are vulnerable um, I have worked in the shelter and spent a great deal of time there, especially in the beginning weeks as we were setting up. Um, I've got to meet many of the individuals that we are serving and I have got, and all of our redeployed workers and staff have enjoyed the opportunity to work with them and realized there is very little to be feared here. Um, and we, we do wanna make a safe environment for all. Thank you, Polly. Uh, what information or contact info uh, or uh, procedure protocol would you give to those uh, neighboring businesses who I understand you you will be contacting or you have not yet contacted, um, and the school board and the neighboring condominium and uh, specifically around. Uh, merit. Uh, they, I do agree. They need to be reassured. There's a fear. And, and we need to do our best to educate and work with all those individuals who are feeling uh, threatened. You know, that the fear is, again, fear and the perception 
of, of what's going to happen. So uh, um, is there a, a preferred protocol or is there a specific uh, way that they can reach out to the municipality to have those fears allayed or work through their, cons their immediate concerns? So what we've done in the past and what I would do if, if this was approved and that is the location um, would be to contact them. And if there's what I tell everybody, if you see a crime in progress or, or a serious occurrence, you should wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you should call the police and you can decide whether it's a 911 emergency or if it's the police and something they need to know on the non-emergency line. If it is. Um, a trend you're seeing, a problem, um, you know, you wanted to speak to someone about it, then I ask people to contact me directly. Um, we also have other staff that cover me when I'm not available here that are easy to access. So anything in an emergency, should we should use our, our police services for, for those sorts of things. Is there any thought to giving to having a, a small community uh, gathering or an information session as to when we anticipate uh, this site, uh, if we if we pass this this evening, uh, when services will be provided, uh, starting to be provided from there? No, <laughs> I have not thought about a gathering. We we do have committees as I have been consulting with um, to have a neighborhood. There's not a requirement for a neighborhood consultation, but I do consult with with groups and I would be happy to do that. Um, I don't know about a physical gathering like at the um, at the shelter, but I could certainly look into to ideas and options on that. That'd be great. I think people, are, as I say, they're they're willing to work with us. They're they're interested in in this maintaining the safety of their environments and their their investments in the community. But uh, I am agreement with you. Uh, this could blend into our communities and neighborhoods. Uh, this is just one of uh, of uh, future endeavors. I'm hoping with regard to uh, affordable and supportive housing in the Chatham Kent's future. So thank you very much. And I will be directing uh, any concerns uh, particularly to yourself, Holly. So I know you're welcome, Matt. Thank you. Councillor Ochi, followed by Councillor Hall. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you, um, I'm just wondering, uh, I, I know you have spent a lot of time looking for places, but I would rather keep the homeless shelter in the uh, Briley Center than put it across the street from a school. Um, I have grave concerns with this coming up in September with the kids going back. Um, I know you said they can call the police, but uh, um, I don't know, I just have a very hard time with this and there, I, I cannot support this uh, particular building. Thank you. Councillor Hall, followed by Councillor C. McGregor. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Uh, very quickly, um, Polly, I think you uh, you might have uh, addressed this already, but uh, just sharing some feedback from a from a Wallaceford resident who's also um, been a volunteer with uh, Chatham Hope Haven um, for a number of years. Um, so th the the resident was asking me if there was going to be some type of a group or a committee or a subcommittee or something formed, um, you know, by the municipality, I guess. Uh, you know, focusing on the shelter so that they can, I want to say coming from the, the member of the community, you know, so they can give input and suggestions towards the shelter and the organization uh, and and that respects everybody that's uh, involved in that. But, it, it, you know, so question, I guess, to staff, it, is there an opportunity for a new group to be created or um, carrying on with what you said before, Polly, is it uh, is the plan to uh, keep working with uh, groups that are already established in the in the community? Uh, and continue working with them in some capacity. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yes, we we already have established groups, um, and one being very new that has a nice, uh, great variety of people with skin in the game in in the homelessness work, um, including grassroots organizations, larger long-term organizations, um, and 
that group, you know, does advise on the whole housing and homelessness continuum. So I think we really want to keep that going. And if it doesn't continue through United Way as COVID and the pandemic, um, you know, at some point things calm down, I do believe we would want to keep that going. Previous to that, we were actively working with that. We had a um, housing and homelessness committee. We still do. Um, it's just been on pause for a little bit during this crisis. Um, so. We don't want to have multiple groups, I think. I mean, we don't want duplication, but it's really important that we have all these different groups at the table and hear their voice. So we're committed to that. Excellent. That's great to hear, Paul. If you can maybe share that with myself or, or maybe with all of council, just so that if we um, come across some other individuals that might be interested in volunteering or helping in some way, that we can share that information with them, that'd be great. Will do. Awesome. Thank you, Mayor Kenna. Uh, Councillor C. McGregor, followed by Councillor Sakachi. Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Um, I I just wanted to uh, I won't reiterate, but uh, Polly, I wanted to thank you for the report that came out and um, for the information. I I know how difficult it must be. We've gone through many many meetings and many many discussions on where we would locate um, um, a shelter, a temporary shelter, and such. And I also want to thank you and your department for offering up some educational uh, opportunities for uh, for counselors. Um, I've able, been able to partake in two of them to help me understand a little bit more of the situation that is happening on the ground. So I want to thank you and I want to thank you for, for the report. And um, I know that, you know, I, ha I know that no matter where a shelter lands, there's nobody is always going to be happy. And um, it looks to me through this report that this is a really good uh, um, scenario for us for the next couple of years as we work through and we help people in our community and our homeless and those that are struggling, especially through the, the COVID pandemic and such. So uh, again, thank you. You, staff, and everyone else. Thanks. Yeah. Easy way to produce better sound quality using your. I will uh, need a motion to extend. We've got three minutes left, and I still have four speakers on this. So, can I get a motion to extend to ten fifteen, please? Uh, Councillor Latimer and Councillor Kirkwood White. So moved. Oh, second. Okay. Anyone opposed? Okay, we'll continue on. Got Councillor Sakachi followed by Councillor Crew. Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. I'll keep my comments very, very short. Uh, I greatly appreciate the detail that went into this report. My concern is is with the heavily, you know, sensitive topic of of the you know the masking situation that this year really hasn't you know gathered the attention from from the public regarding their their input and i just wanted to, to touch base with either polly uh, or or dr Reedike in regards to the time um from the community engagement aspect do you do you feel that uh, and i know that know, know the timeline is standardized but do you feel that we've given the the appropriate opportunity to the residents of the community uh from a time perspective to weigh in uh, their output input sorry input my apologies so I think, uh, Mayor Kenneth, it's uh, April Retech, General Manager, Community Human Services. I, I think uh, with what we were charged to do from Council uh, and Polly and her team uh, have worked for, for extensively for weeks to pull this report together. Um, they have been out and about uh, looking at as many locations as possible, meeting with uh, as many groups um, as we could with respect to uh, both kind of locations and operations of uh, a shelter. I think that this report uh, certainly is presented to Council You've received feedback both uh, on both sides of the issue. We certainly know that this is a difficult 
decision. And um, we feel uh, that this is for a temporary location, the best uh, location that at this time we have. And uh, our only other um, alternative is, is really to remain at the Bradley Centre, which is not what uh, is in the best interest of the Bradley Centre and uh, everything that is uh, certainly required there. This is uh, a very good location allows for some great uh, community partnerships and interactions with uh, the individuals uh, staying at the shelter to get them moved towards permanent housing. And um, I, I think that that that, that uh, my best way to answer that question is that we have, um, really completed everything that council has asked us to do. And uh, this report uh, is before you. So we take direction from council. And I don't know, Polly, if there's anything else that you would like to add to that? Um, no, thank you. And then my last comment is is that you know, Dr. Reed, we you know we've had numerous conversations, and you've been fantastic, and your team's fantastic at responding to them. But you know, there there is some challenges, obviously, that we you know we have as a community has faced, and and Paulie did touch base on the mitigation efforts that uh, you know has transpired. Uh, you know, is there going to be a partnership working with the the school on 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 education as well regarding um, you know potential. Um, you know, mitigation efforts uh, as well. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. That is that is definitely in the plans, um, and we have we have learned a lot in the last three months um, to how you know about a little bit of public education and and how to bring comfort to the area and how to share information back and forth in a timely manner. Um, also, we've, you know, community mobilization and the police are excellent resources to us and to the community. So we would partner with them on that um, and continue that work. Thank you for your, your hard work in the, and your comments. Councillor Crew, followed by Councillor Harrigan. Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Um, I sent some questions or thoughts on to um, April and Polly. So, um, so I'm just going through what hasn't been asked. How many people on average um, are utilizing the shelter? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, that, that varies greatly daily, but on average, we have um, probably right now about 50 people coming through every day now what that means doesn't mean they're necessarily staying there a portion of those individuals are diverted to other accommodations other safe accommodations or in some cases to motels if that is more suitable oh good um what services uh do you have um i guess wraparound services in the shelter and i think that that would probably go to the caw building as well yeah, so we've been gradually ramping those up as as we've gotten, you know, really gotten under operations going. What uh, we have is, um, you know, mental health and addiction services, referral services, housing supports. Most of what we do, though, because we're a housing focused shelter, is that we want people to go to those services. Mm -hmm. um, or to, you know, so we we make those connections, we get the transportation sorted out, we we make those linkages and and help people that way. Um, every every individual that stays with us has a housing support worker to focus on housing, but the other services are um, very well connected, and they do do some drop in to get things started. Good. Um, how many out of towners do we get? There's there's a this um, idea that half the shelter is full of people from everywhere else because we make it easy. Yes, and that couldn't be farther from the truth. It's, um, in fact, 
we only have about 8% of the individuals that have come to our door um, have been from outside of Chatham-Kent and they do not stay, they would be diverted to their home community unless they're in a, if they're in a human trafficking domestic violence situation, then we would consult with the women's shelter and, um, you know, police and, and work on a plan with those individuals. But it's a very small, it's a relatively small percent and, um, that is a, a standard practice in the southwest and in, in most communities because people are more attached to their home community and they'll do better there. Okay. Um, thank you, Polly. And I, I want to thank you all for this report. Uh, I think we all noticed when some when you were doing your work and, and investigating different options because uh, the dust would start to fly wherever um, people were hearing that a shelter may be going. There is no good answer for this. And the thing is, it's ugly, it's messy, and no one wants to deal with it. We have had a heck of a year as council. For, it's, 2020 has really been awful. Um, but, you know, dealing with these things, these are human beings. And there's that fear because they act different, they look different. They, you know, they didn't ask for mental health issues, you know. And sometimes that leads to addiction issues and, and for whatever reason, or they're just down on their luck and need a place to stay. We need to take care of our, our people. And I think that uh, you learned a lot of lessons with the temporary shelter. And I think that um, with this temporary model, and I really like that we're going to the end well, um, uh, investigating that more. And I wanna thank Councillor Kirkwood White for sticking sticking with that because I think that that was a great thing to do and she had the time and energy to put into that. So I wanna thank her. I will support this, um, but I will encourage the community if they have any issues, please talk to someone at the center or get a hold of yourself because I think that um, we're doing the right thing. Um, and I, I, it doesn't matter where we would have put it, the neighbors would not be happy. But I encourage them to, you know, Say hi when somebody's walking by that doesn't look the way that you do. That's all I have. Thank you. Councillor Harrigan, followed by Councillor Solman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Through you to Polly. Polly, some of these questions have been inferred already, but I was wondering if you could clarify for me um, what the typical operating hours of this shelter is for people to stay there in the evening and then in the morning. Um, currently, the shelter is open 24-7. We only have intake between 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. Uh, we are looking at a new model um, after the move and in time that is uh, more housing focus sheltering. We're still researching all of that. Uh, we don't plan on closing per se, but we may only be offering um, sort of different services in the daytime. Um, and it's it's based on best practices, but right now it is it's twenty four seven with with limited intake hours. Okay, thank you. Um, just thinking about the area, and uh, I actually drive fairly close to um, that location on my way to the hospital each day, going to work. And prior to COVID, um, if I was running late for work, I would run into a fairly high number of young people foot traffic as they're making their way to the school and so i imagine that given this population is also heavily walking that there will be conversations with the school board around you know high traffic times and usage and where the shelter can fit in so that there is a positive merger with the neighborhood am i correct in that assumption yes okay um i so thank you. And I want to echo certainly Councillor Crew and Councillor uh, C. McGregor's comments and others. I think that um, this has been and will continue to be a contentious and difficult issue. As a municipality, our housing first model is something that uh, staff has been very committed to. And, and I, I feel like they've felt the support of council in those housing first models. Um, and this is something that we're doing uh, not because of a change in ideology, but because of a change in environment. And that environment is the COVID-19 pandemic that we need to respond to. Um, so I am, you know, looking forward to continuing to see reports on the shelter and also 
the report on Indwell for uh, potential programming and wraparound services because um, I think that that will be that will be a wonderful partnership should it be successful. And in the interim, um, I just want to echo the encouragement of the neighborhood to um, be open-minded, but also be willing to share their experiences if they have any um, concerns with the council and staff as they go forward. Okay, uh, last speaker is Councillor Solomon. Okay, I think I'm on. Uh, I have a question that was asked, but it wasn't the same answer that I expected. And that was how many on average do you have staying overnight? And, and that's a different question than how many are being serviced. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, nighttime numbers do go down somewhat. I don't have that number in front of me. We don't really track nighttime stay because people could stay a portion of the night or um, people are free to come and go or sorry they're free to go after 10 p.m they can't come back in um, so we do have some people that leave at like six in the morning or you know they're not necessarily there all night we go by who is registered with us um, that is typically what we track but I mean if I was sort of hazarding a guess we would be in the 30 to 40 range no. See, I, I've been I've taken the time to go over there and watch what's going on, and uh, in the neighborhood where the tent city is, and uh, I do see a lot of people being serviced, but I also see them taking out bags of food and going across the railway tracks to uh, to other places. So when you say servicing, I take it that that's the people who don't necessarily stay overnight and don't need the shelter, don't want the shelter. I guess is the answer because they may have dogs or or drugs or whatever. Um, so, uh, I, I suspect the number that are staying overnight are fairly low, uh, in relative terms to how many you say you're servicing. Um, I think, uh, Councilor Cruz right that there is no good answer. And the reason for that is we shouldn't be in the shelter business. And we had a good, we have an excellent policy that, uh, is a housing first model and that's what we should be doing. Uh, uh, these are human beings and. Shelters to me are warehouses. You're warehousing human beings and there's nothing worse. Um, if you looked at today's Globe and Mail on the front page, this very issue was on the front page of the Globe and Mail and uh, Toronto is moving towards putting people in motel rooms. And here we are, we, we've always done that. And we're, we're putting in place, place a so-called temporary emergency shelter. Um, about as temporary probably as the uh, 1917 uh, Temporary Income Tax Act. Uh, when we when you use bricks and mortar, uh, it's going to be someday. How are you going to say to people who are there? Uh, so long. So too bad. Lease is up. Uh, you're out at the curb now. I don't understand how that how that's going to how you're going to deal with that when the time comes. Can you answer that question? Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, it is our as um, as outlined in the in the report as well. The idea we we started this shelter because we did not have enough motel rooms. We were not different than any other communities. Communities that had shelters went to motel rooms on top of the shelters. Communities that didn't have shelters had to open shelters because they ran out of motel rooms. So we were, that's the situation we were in. So our goal is to, with this social services relief fund, is to put all this energy into housing everybody through the shelter services. And as we do that, we should have less and less over the months to come um, so that we are back to a manageable amount that we can use motels again as our primary place for transitional housing okay but right now uh you're using the temp an even worse location perhaps than this one if that can be possible um and people are going in and they're getting meals that they wouldn't get if they were in motels and i i can't understand why if i were in that situation why i i, I think i'm probably in a better situation than i was if i was 
um, you know, six months ago, nine months ago, before the uh, the COVID emergency. And so I'm, I mean, people put to me, how how are you going to all of a sudden say, no, that that's come to an end? That's the question that's being put uh, by um, thoughtful people in the community, because I really, I've supported from the beginning this housing first model, and I, I think it's the best way to go. Um, this location is right adjacent to a new adjacent to a uh, condominium and a whole new subdivision that's being developed and across from a school. I can't understand why that's the prime location that you could find and that you rejected um, municipally owned land behind the uh, animal shelter, an area that is available, but for some reason you didn't want to use temporary uh, uh, a temporary facility and have one built there. You just rejected it. Out, as I read the report, you sort of rejected it out of hand. What's the reason for that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, yeah, and I apologize. The report was intended to be brief for readability, but there was a lot of thought put into land. Um, but the consideration, it was apparent that the, it was important for us to move quickly. There was also no capital funds to build, and we didn't have a temporary solution that was cost effective um, to put on the land and for servicing the land. And, there, and in those meetings that we had, there was a lot more complications and it wasn't as simple as it had been um, thought to be, because uh, we did consider that as an option. Um, the the location there is a limited amount of locations that were available to lease in the community um and that is why this one was chosen well i'll have, we'll to, inter I'll have to interrupt quickly uh, we need another extension we're already two minutes past so i need another uh, motion to go to 10 30. uh councillor kirkwood white and councillor harrigan can i get the that on the floor so moved seconded uh anyone opposed uh, carried. Okay, Councillor Solomon, you're back on. Thanks. Okay, so the location that I'd suggested was the former uh, public works uh, area at uh, right adjacent to our animal shelter. That was one, uh, and it would only be a temporary building, no bricks and mortar, uh, which signals temporary. Um, I'm disappointed that that wasn't uh, given more uh, thought. Uh, the uh, the landlord of the property that you have owns um, warehousing at the end of uh, Raleigh Street beside the uh, CN uh, rail. Uh, I didn't see any consideration of the warehousing that's available there either. Um, I, I just I have a concern when we try to shoehorn things into existing subdivisions uh, that are inappropriate and uh, are not compatible with what's already there. Um, I mean, I, and I really have a philosophical problem because I, there, but for the grace of God goes any one of us. And I, I hate to see people warehoused in shelters when they should be, um, following the housing first model. Um, uh, um, anyway, those are my comments and I'm certainly not going to support this. I don't think it's a good location at all. I think there are other options. They're not as nice, maybe, but there are other options. And um, now the other question I have, though, before I hang up on this, and that is, uh, are you going to have full time, 24 hour security people available uh, on site to make sure that um, we don't the neighbors don't experience what uh, the neighbors of uh, the Bradley Center experience uh, needles? Uh, 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 human waste, uh, all sorts of other problems. Thank you, Mr. Bear. We will have uh, security on site. 24-7? 24-7. Okay. Anyway, I, I can't swear. I just don't think it's a good location. And I, it's... Uh, and I don't think, I think, although you've contacted and discussed with groups, you haven't discussed anything with the neighbors. It's uh, groups who are 
uh, volunteers and advocates uh, for uh, homelessness, but there's two sides to it and there's also neighbors. Now, on the other hand, I don't have a problem with uh, paragraph number two. Um, but I think in, in regard to that, in the future, we have to consider not shoehorning um, things into existing neighborhoods. But I'm going to, so I'll ask that you separate the questions so that we can vote on uh, each one of them. And that's all I have. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay, seeing no other questions, uh, we'll split the vote. However, we have a problem that uh, the we only we don't only have one more voting option. So if we split number one, we can do electronically. Number two, we'll have to do. Uh, uh, I'll do a uh, anyone opposed on the the second option. So we're just gonna we're gonna separate that based on Councillor Solomon's request. All right, we're getting uh, ready, uh, just waiting to separate the two. Okay, so we're voting on the first one, on the recommendation to number one. Waiting for one more. All votes are in. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, for, for the second one, we'll do. Uh, you put that on the screen to show what everybody's voting. What we're voting on. We're voting on number two. A full report on the option of Indwell as a long-term housing solution for the individuals in need of supportive housing. Uh, that's what we're voting on now. Anyone opposed to that? Hearing none, we'll assume that, uh, well, everyone is in favor of that one. Uh, and based on time, uh, we got a notice of motion. Anyone, any, Councillor Thompson has a mo notice of motion present? Uh, yes, I certainly do. It's going to take me about six seconds to, uh, to pull it up here. Uh, all right. I, Councillor Trevor Thompson, hereby provide notice. I'll bring the following motion for conversation, uh, debate, and voting at the September 14th Council meeting. Whereas Chatham Kent's lawn grass and weed bylaw was introduced to implement a minimum outdoor landscaping maintenance standard that prohibits overgrown grasses and weeds on private properties, similar to lawn grass bylaws in other communities, Chatham Kent's bylaw maintains community aesthetics and prevents landscape abandonment. The bylaw applies to all grasses and weed species listed in the Government of Ontario's publication 505 Ontario Weeds and requires they be kept under 20 centimeters in height through regular mowing or be subject to enforcement. However, it is also a community strategic objective to enhance natural areas in the municipality, and there is a conflict that exists within the long grass bylaw in meeting these objectives. Specifically, there are challenges that the current grass cutting bylaw poses with respect to legitimate tall grass prairie environmental naturalization activities on private lands. And despite the positive intent of the bylaw, the way it is currently written can be used to reverse these environmental stewardship, uh, stewardship activities that the municipality has otherwise identified as desirable. Therefore, be it resolved that administra administration prepare a report with recommendations on how the bylaw could be altered so that it maintains its initial policy intent while also recognizing the community benefits realized through appropriate naturalization activities. Okay, uh, uh, item 17, closed session reports. Councillor uh, C. McGregor. Thank you, and through the mayor, I would move that uh, council, or the closed session report, Monday, August 10th, um, all were present. Council direct administration on personal matters about uh, identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees, with regard to appointment to the age friendly committee, section 2392B, Municipal Act 2001. Council received information on 
One, advice that is subject to solicitor-client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose and a trade secret or scientific, technical, commercial, financial, or labor, labor relations information supplied in confidence to the municipality or local board, which is disclosed, could, could reasonably be expected to prejudice significant the competitive position or interfere significantly with contractual or other negotiations of a personal group, person or organizations in regard to rural fiber backbone agreement and support for Tech Savvy Solution Inc. Improving connectivity for Ontario Section 2392F and I Municipal Act 2001. Also received information on a proposed or pending disposition of land by the municipality or local board and advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communication necessary for that purpose with regard to 540 Park Ave, Unit 5, Section 2392 CNF of the Municipal Act 2001. Received information on advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege including communications necessary for that purpose with regard to Mass Bylaw, Section 2392F and Missile Act 2001, and received advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose with regard to consent and zoning bylaw amendment 5295 to Compsey Line, Tilbury East, Section 2392F of the Municipal Act. Councillor Pinsano, can I get a second on that? I will second it. Okay, anyone opposed? Carried, uh, any non-agenda business item? A... Hearing none, uh, the reading of the bylaws, first and second. Okay, sorry, I need to approve, apparently I need to approve the communication items. Can I get uh, Councilor McGrail and Councilor Wright, uh, will you put that forward? Moved. Seconded. Okay, anyone opposed? Carried. First and second reading, uh, Councillor Oche and Councillor Harrigan. Moved. Seconded. Anyone opposed? Sorry, just before we finish that, I just needed to get in quickly just to remind Council that 8A, we added a new bylaw due to the motion that was made. In 8B, we revised the bylaw, and we will be listing that one as the one to approve, and that the mask mandatory mask bylaw will be included in these first, second, and third readings tonight. Okay. Uh, third reading, uh, Councillor B. McGregor and Councillor C. McGregor. So moved. Happy to move. Anyone opposed? Carried. Uh, resolution of Council. Thank you. Through the Mayor, I would move that Tadden Kent Council adjourn to its next meeting to be held on Monday, September 14th, 2020, and that Chadden Kent Council authorize itself to meet in closed session on that day to discuss any matters permitted by the Municipal Act. And uh, seconded by Councillor Hall. Happy to second, Mayor Kenneth. Anyone opposed? Uh, and happy birthday, uh, Councillor Hall. Enjoy your last hour and a half. All right. Thank you very Have a great much. Great day, everyone. Happy Bye. birthday, Aaron. Good night, everybody.